tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Let me start off by saying that Peter Terry was addicted to heroin. We were friends in college and continued to be after I graduated. Notice that I said I. He dropped out after two years of barely cutting it. After I moved out of the dorms into a small apartment, I didn't see Peter as much. We would talk online every now and then. AOL Instant Messenger was king in pre-Facebook years. There was a period where he wasn't online for about five weeks straight. I wasn't worried. He was a pretty notorious flake and drug addict, so I assumed he just stopped caring. But then one night, I saw him come on. Before I could initiate a conversation, he sent me a message. David, man, we need to talk. That was when he told me about the No End House. It got the name because no one had ever reached the final exit. The rules were pretty simple and cliche. Reach the final room of the building and you win $500, nine rooms in all. The house was located outside the city, roughly four miles from my house. Apparently he had tried and failed. He was a heroin and who knows what else addict, so I figured the drugs got the best of him and he wigged out at a paper ghost or something. He told me it would be too much for anyone, that it was unnatural. I didn't believe him, why would I? I told him I would check it out the next night and no matter how hard he tried to convince me otherwise, $500 sounded too good to be true. I had to. I set out the following night. This is what happened. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something strange about the building. Have you ever seen or read something that shouldn't be scary, but for some reason a chill crawls up your spine? I walked towards the door, and the feeling of uneasiness only intensified as I opened the front door. My heart slowed and I let a relieved sigh leave me as I entered. The room looked like a normal hotel lobby decorated for Halloween. A sign was posted in place of a worker. It read, Room 1, this way. Eight more follow, reach the end, and you win. I chuckled and made my way to the first door. The first area was almost laughable. The decor resembled the Halloween aisle of a Kmart, complete with sheet ghosts and animatronic zombies that gave a static growl when you passed by. At the far end was an exit, the only door besides the one I entered through. I brushed through the fake spider webs and headed to the second room. I was greeted by fog as I opened the door to room two. The room definitely upped the ante in terms of technology. Not only was there a fog machine, but a bat hung from the ceiling and flew in a circle. Scary. They seemed to have a Halloween soundtrack that one would find in a 99 cent store on loop somewhere in the room. I didn't see a stereo, but I guess they must have used a PA system. I stepped over a few toy rats that wheeled around and walked with a puffed chest across the room to the next area. I reached for the doorknob and my heart sank to my knees. I did not want to open that door. A feeling of dread hit me so hard I could barely even think. Logic overtook me after a few terrified moments, and I shook it off and entered the next room. Room 3 is when things began to change. On the surface, it looked like a normal room. There was a chair in the middle of the wood-paneled floor, a single lamp in the corner did a poor job of lighting the area. It cast a few shadows across the floor and walls. That was the problem. Shadows. Plural. In addition to the shadow being cast by the chair, there were others. I had barely walked in the door, and I was already terrified. It was at that moment that I knew something wasn't right. I didn't even think, as I automatically tried to open the door I came through. It was locked from the other side. That set me off. Was something locking it as I progressed? There was no way I would have heard them. Was it a mechanical lock that set automatically? Maybe. 
but I was too scared to really think. I turned back to the room and the shadows were gone. The chair's shadow remained, but the others were gone. I slowly began to walk. I used to hallucinate when I was a kid, so I wrote off the shadows as a figment of my imagination. I began to feel better as I made it to the halfway point of the room. I looked down as I took my steps, and that's when I saw it, or didn't see it. My own shadow wasn't there. I didn't have time to scream without thinking I ran as fast as I could to the other door and flung myself into the room beyond. The fourth room was possibly the most disturbing. As I closed the door, all light seemed to be sucked out and put back into the previous room. I stood there surrounded by darkness and I couldn't move. I'm not afraid of the dark and never have been, but I was absolutely terrified. All sight had left me. I held my hand in front of my face, and if I didn't know I was doing so, I would have never been able to tell. Darkness isn't a sufficient word to describe it. I couldn't hear anything, nothing but dead silence. When you're in a soundproof room, you could still hear yourself breathing. You can hear yourself being alive. I couldn't. I began to stumble forward after a few moments, my rapidly beating heart the only thing I could feel. There was no door in sight. I wasn't even sure there was a door this time. The silence was then broken by a low hum. I felt something behind me. I spun around wildly but could barely even see my nose. I knew it was there though. Regardless of how dark it was, I knew something was there. The hum grew louder, closer. It seemed to surround me, but I knew whatever was causing the noise was in front of me, inching closer. I took a step back. I'd never felt that kind of fear. I can't really describe true fear. I wasn't even scared I was going to die. I was scared of what the alternative was. I was afraid of what this thing had in store for me. Then the lights flashed for less than a second, and I saw it. Nothing. I saw nothing, and I know I saw nothing there. The room was again plunged into darkness, and the hum became a wild screech. I screamed in protest. I couldn't stand to listen to the sound for another minute. I ran backwards, away from the noise, and fumbled for the door handle. I turned, and as I did, so I fell into room five. Before I describe Room 5, you have to understand something. I am not a drug addict. Short of the childhood hallucinations I mentioned earlier, I have had no history of drug abuse or any sort of psychosis, and in my younger years, I only suffered from such hallucinations when I was really tired or just waking up. I entered the no-end house with a clear head. After falling in from the previous room, my view of Room 5 was from my back, looking up at the ceiling. What I saw didn't scare me, it simply surprised me. Trees had grown into the room and towered above my head. The ceilings in this room were taller than the others, which made me think I was in the center of the house. I got up off the floor, dusted myself off, and took a look around. It was definitely the biggest room yet. I couldn't even see the door from where I was, as various brush and trees blocked my line of sight leading to the exit. Up until this point, I figured the rooms were going to get scarier, but this was a paradise compared to the last room. I also assumed that whatever was back in room 4 stayed back there. I was incredibly wrong. As I made my way deeper into the room, I began to hear what one would hear if they were in a forest. Chirping bugs and the occasional flap of birds seemed to be my only company in this room. That was the thing that bothered me the most. I heard the bugs and other animals, but I didn't see any of them. I began to wonder how big the house was. When I had first walked up to the house from the outside, it looked like a regular house. It was definitely on the bigger side, but certainly it wasn't large enough to contain a full forest. And yet here it was. A thick, towering mass of trees, all somehow contained within room 5. The canopy covered my view of the ceiling, but I assumed it was still there, however high it was. I couldn't see any walls though. If it hadn't been for the standard dark wood paneling on the floor, which matched that of the other rooms, I would have had no way of knowing I was still indoors. I kept walking, 
hoping that the next tree I passed would reveal the door. After a few moments of walking, I felt a mosquito fly onto my arm. I shook it off and kept going. A second later, I felt about ten more land on my skin in different places. I felt them crawl up and down my arms and legs, and a few made their way across my face. I flailed wildly to get them all off, but they just kept crawling. I looked down and let out a muffled scream, more of a whimper, to be honest. I didn't see a single bug. Not one bug was on me, but I could feel them crawl. I heard them fly by my face and sting my skin, but I couldn't see a single one. I dropped to the ground and began to roll wildly. I was desperate. I hated bugs, especially ones I couldn't see or touch, but these bugs could touch me, and they were everywhere. I began to crawl, though I had no idea where I was going. The entrance was nowhere in sight, and I still hadn't even seen the exit. So I just crawled, my skin wriggling with the presence of those phantom bugs. After what seemed like hours, I found the door. I grabbed the nearest tree and propped myself up, mindlessly slapping my arms and legs to no avail. I tried to run, but I couldn't. My body was exhausted from crawling and dealing with whatever it was that was on me. I took a few shaky steps to the door, grabbing each tree on the way for support. It was only a few feet away when I heard it. The low hum from before. It was coming from the next room, and it was deeper. I could almost feel it inside my body, like when you stand next to an amp at a concert. The feeling of the bugs on me lessened as the hum grew louder. As I placed my hand on the doorknob, the bugs were completely gone. But I couldn't bring myself to turn the knob. I knew that if I let go, the bugs would return, and there was no way I would make it back to room four. I just stood there, my head pressed against the door marked with the number six, and grasped the knob with my shaking hands. By that point, the hum was so loud I couldn't even hear myself pretend to think. There was nothing I could do but move on. Room 6 was next, and room 6 was hell. I closed the door behind me, my eyes held shut and my ears ringing, the hum was surrounding me. As the door clicked into place, the hum quickly lessened in intensity, and was soon gone. I opened my eyes in surprise, and the door I had shut was gone, it was just a wall now. I looked around in shock. The room was identical to room 3, with the same chair and lamp, but with the correct number of shadows this time. The only real difference was that there was no exit door, and the one I entered through was now gone. As I said before, I had no previous issues in terms of mental instability, but at that moment I fell into what I now know was insanity. I didn't scream, I didn't make a sound, at first I scratched softly. The wall was tough, but I knew the door was there somewhere, I just knew it was. I scratched at where the doorknob was, I clawed at the wall frantically with both hands, tore at the wood, filing my nails down to the skin. Then I fell silently to my knees. The only sound in the room was the incessant scratching against the wall. I knew it was there. The door was there. I knew it was just there. If I knew I could get past this wall, I... Are you all right? I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me and saw what it was that spoke to me. And to this day, I regret ever turning around. It was a little girl. A little girl wearing a soft white dress that went down to her ankles. She had white skin, blue eyes, and long blonde hair reaching to the middle of her back. She was the most frightening thing I had ever seen and I know that nothing in my life will ever be as unnerving as what I saw in her. While looking at her, I saw the young girl, but I also saw something else. Where she stood, I saw what looked like a man's body, only larger than normal and covered in hair. He was naked from head to toe, but his head was not human, and his toes were hooves. It wasn't the devil, but at that moment it might as well have been. The form had the head of a ram and the snout of a wolf. It was horrifying, and it was synonymous with the little girl in front of me. They were the same form, I can't really describe it, but I saw them at the same time. They shared the same spot in that room, but it was like looking at two separate dimensions. 
When I saw the girl, I saw the form, and when I saw the form, I saw the girl I couldn't speak. I could barely even see. My mind was revolting against what it was attempting to process. I had never been scared before in my life, and I had never been more scared than when I was trapped in the fourth room. But that was before room six. I just stood there staring at whatever it was that spoke to me. There was no exit. I was trapped in there with it. And then it spoke again. David, David you, you should, should have, have listened. listened. When it spoke, I heard the words of the little girl, but the other form spoke through my mind in a voice I won't attempt to describe. There was no other sound. The voice just kept repeating that sentence over and over into my mind, and I agreed. I didn't know what to do. I was slipping into madness, yet I couldn't take my eyes off what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. I thought I had passed out, but the room wouldn't let me. I just wanted it to end. I was on my side, my eyes wide open, the form staring down at me. Scurrying across the floor in front of me was one of the battery-powered rats from the second room. The house was toying with me, but for some reason seeing that rat pulled my mind back from whatever depths it was headed for, and I looked around the room. I was getting out of there. I was determined to get out of that house and live and never think about this place again. I knew this room was hell, and I wasn't ready to take up residency. At first, it was just my eyes that moved. I searched the walls for any kind of opening. The room wasn't that big, so I didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. The demon still taunted me, the voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I placed my hand on the floor and lifted myself up to all fours, and I turned to scan the wall behind me. And then I saw something I couldn't believe. The form was now right at my back, whispering into my ear. You should have come, David. I felt its breath on the back of my neck, but I refused to turn around. A large rectangle was scratched into the wood with a small dent chipped away in the center of it. And right in front of my eyes, I saw the large number seven I had mindlessly etched into the wall. I knew what it was. Room seven was just beyond that wall where room five had been moments ago. I don't know how I managed to do it, maybe it was just my state of mind at the time, but I had created the door, I knew I had. In my madness I had scratched into the wall what I needed the most, an exit to the next room. Room 7 was close, I knew the demon was right behind me, but for some reason it couldn't touch me. I closed my eyes and placed both hands on the large number 7 in front of me, and I pushed. I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming in my ear. It told me I was never leaving. It told me that this was the end, but that I wasn't going to die. That I was going to live there in room six with it. I wasn't. I pushed and screamed at the top of my lungs. I knew I was going to push through the wall. Eventually, I clenched my eyes shut and screamed, and the demon was gone. I was left in silence. I turned around slowly and was greeted by the room as it was when I entered, just a chair and a lamp. I couldn't believe it, but I didn't have time to dwell. I turned back to the seven and jumped back slightly. What I saw was a door, not one that I had scratched in, but a regular door with a large seven on it. My whole body was shaking. It took me a while to turn the knob. I just stood there for a while staring at the door. I couldn't stay in room six. I couldn't. But if this was only room six, I couldn't imagine what seven had in store. I must have stood there for an hour, just staring at the seven. Finally, with a deep breath, I twisted the knob and opened the door to room seven. I stumbled through the door mentally exhausted and physically weak. The door behind me closed and I realized where I was. I was outside. Not outside like room 5, but actually outside. My eyes stung, I wanted to cry, I fell to my knees and tried to force myself to tear up, but I couldn't. I was finally out of that hell. I didn't even care about the prize that was promised. I turned and saw that the door I just went through was the entrance. I walked to my car and drove home, thinking of how nice a shower sounded.
As I pulled up to the house, I felt uneasy. The joy of leaving No End House had faded, and the dread was slowly building in my stomach. I shook it off as residual fear of the house and made my way to the front door. I entered and immediately went up to my room. On my bed was my cat, Baskerville. He was the first living thing I had seen all night, and I reached out to pet him. He hissed and swiped at my hand. I recoiled in shock, as he had never acted like that. I thought, whatever, he's an old cat, and I headed to the bathroom. I jumped in the shower and prepared for what I expected to be a sleepless night. After my shower, I went to my kitchen to make some food. I descended the stairs and turned into the family room, and what I saw is forever burned into my mind. My parents were lying on the ground, naked, covered in blood. They were mutilated to such a degree that I hardly recognized them. Their limbs were removed and placed next to their bodies, and their heads were placed on their chests, facing me. The most unsettling part was their expressions. They were smiling, as though they were happy to see me. I vomited and sobbed right there in the family room. I didn't know what had happened. They didn't even live with me at the time. I was a mess. And then I saw it. A door that had never been there before. A door with the large number 8 scrawled on it in blood. I was still in the no-end house. I was standing in what I thought was my family room, but it was room 7. As this occurred to me, I happened to notice that the smile on the faces of my parents' severed heads were widening. They weren't my parents, I thought. They couldn't be, but they looked exactly like them. Across the room beyond the mutilated corpses before me, I saw a door marked with the number 8. I knew I had to move on, but at that moment, I gave up. The smiling faces tore into my mind, grounding me where I stood. I vomited again and nearly collapsed. Then the hum returned. It was louder than ever, and it filled the house and shook the walls. The hum compelled me to walk. I began to walk slowly, making my way closer to the door and to the bodies. I could barely stand, let alone walk, and the closer I got to my parents, the closer I came to suicide. The walls were now shaking so hard it seemed as though they were going to crumble, but still the faces smiled at me. As I inched closer, their eyes followed me. When I was between the two bodies a few feet from the door, the dismembered hands began to crawl their way across the carpet towards me. All the while, the faces continued to stare. New terror washed over me, and I walked faster. I didn't want to hear them speak. I didn't want to hear the voices to match those of my parents. They began to open their mouths and the hands were now inches from my feet. In desperation, I lunged towards the door, threw it open, and slammed it shut behind me. That was it, I thought. Room 8, I was done. After what I had just experienced, I knew there wasn't anything else the house could throw at me that I couldn't live through. There was nothing short of the fires of hell that I wasn't ready for. Unfortunately, I underestimated the abilities of No End House. To my horror, Room 8 was more disturbing, more terrifying, and more unspeakable. I still have trouble believing what I saw in Room 8. Once again, the room was a carbon copy of Room 3, but now in the chair that had previously been empty, there sat a man. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that the man sitting in the chair was me. Not someone who looked like me. It was David Williams. I walked closer. Even though I was sure of it, I had to get a better look. He looked up at me, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Please, please don't do it. Please don't hurt me. What? I said. Who are you? I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, you are, he sobbed. You're going to hurt me, and I don't want you to. He sat in the chair with his legs up and began rocking back and forth. It was actually really pathetic looking, especially since he was me, identical in every way. Listen, who are you? I was now only a few feet from my doppelganger. It was the weirdest experience yet, standing there talking to myself. I wasn't scared, but I would be soon. Why are you- You're going to hurt me! You're going to hurt me! It interrupted. If you want to leave, you're going to hurt me. Why are you saying this? I asked. Just calm down, alright? Let's try to figure this- And then I saw it. 
that David sitting down was wearing the same clothes as me, except for a small red patch on his shirt, embroidered with the number 9. You're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me, don't, please, you're going to hurt me. My eyes didn't leave that small number on his chest, I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors had been plain and simple, but after a while they got a little more ambiguous. Seven had been scratched into the wall by my own hands. Eight had been marked in blood above the bodies of my parents, but nine? This number was on a person. A living person. And worse still, it was on a person that looked exactly like me. David? I had to ask. Yes. You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me. He continued to sob and rock. He answered to David. He was me. Right down to the voice. But that nine. I paced around for a few minutes while he sobbed in his chair. The room had no door. And similarly to room six, the door I came through was gone. For some reason, I assumed that scratching would get me nowhere this time. I studied the walls and floor around the chair, sticking my head underneath and seeing if anything was below. Unfortunately, there was. Below the chair, there was a knife. Attached was a tag that read, To David, From Management. The feeling in my stomach as I read that tag was something sinister. I wanted to throw up. And the last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under that chair. The other David was still sobbing uncontrollably. My mind was spinning into an attic of unanswerable questions. Who put this here? And how did they get my name? Not to mention the fact as I knelt on the cold wood floor, I also sat in that chair, sobbing in protest of being hurt by myself. It was all too much to process. The house and the management had been playing with me this whole time. My thoughts for some reason turned to Peter and whether or not he got this far. And if he did, if he met a Peter Terry sobbing in this very chair, rocking back and forth, what did he do? I shook those thoughts out of my head. They didn't matter. I took the knife from under the chair and immediately the other David went quiet. David, he said in my voice, what do you think you're going to do? I lifted myself from the ground and clenched the knife in my hand. I'm going to get out of here. David was still sitting in the chair, though he was very calm now. He looked up at me with a slight grin. I couldn't tell if he was going to laugh or strangle me. Slowly, he got up from the chair and stood facing me. It was uncanny. His height and even the way he stood matched mine. I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand and I gripped it tighter. I didn't know what I was planning on doing with it, but I had the feeling I was going to need it. Now, his voice was slightly deeper than my own, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you, and I'm going to keep you here. I didn't respond, I just lunged and tackled him to the ground. I mounted him and looked down, knife poised and ready. He looked up at me, terrified. It was like I was looking in a mirror. Then the hum returned, low and distant, though I still felt it deep in my body. David looked up at me as I looked down at myself. The hum was getting louder and I felt something inside me snap. With one motion, I slammed the knife into the patch on his chest and ripped down. Blackness fell on the room and I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had ever experienced up to that point. Room 3 was dark, but it didn't come close to what was completely engulfing me. After a while, I wasn't even sure I was falling. I felt weightless, covered in dark. And then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed, and suicidal. The sight of my parents entered my mind. I knew it wasn't real, but I had seen it. And the mind has trouble differentiating between what is real and what isn't. The sadness only deepened. It was in room nine, for what seemed like days, the final room, and that's exactly what it was. The end. No End House had an end, and I had reached it. At that moment I gave up, I knew I would be in that in-between state forever, accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. I had lost all senses, 
I couldn't feel myself. I couldn't hear anything. Sight was useless there, and I searched for taste in my mouth and found nothing. I felt disembodied and completely lost. I knew where I was. It was hell. Room 9 was hell. And then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. Then I felt ground come up from below me, and I was standing. After a moment or two of gathering my thoughts and senses, I slowly walked towards that light. As I approached the light, it took form. It was a vertical slit down the side of a door, this time unmarked. I slowly walked through the door and found myself back where I started, standing in the lobby of No End House. It was exactly how I left it. Still empty, still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. After everything that had happened that night, I was still wary of where I was. After a few moments of normalcy, I looked around the place, trying to find anything different. On the desk was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten on it. Immensely curious, yet still cautious, I mustered up the courage to open the envelope. Inside was a letter, again handwritten. David Williams, congratulations! You have made it to the end of No End House. Please accept this prize as a token of your great achievement. Yours forever, Management. With the letter, there were five $100 bills. I couldn't stop laughing. I laughed for what seemed like hours. I laughed as I walked out to my car and laughed as I drove home. I laughed as I pulled into my driveway and laughed as I approached the front door to my house. And I laughed when I saw the small number 10 etched into the wood. Certain houses, like certain persons, manage somehow to proclaim at once their character for evil. In the case of a ladder, no particular feature need betray them. They may boast an open countenance and an ingenious smile, and yet a little of their company leaves the unalterable conviction that there is something radically amiss with their being, that they are evil. Willy-nilly, they seem to communicate an atmosphere of secret and wicked thoughts which makes those in their immediate neighborhood shrink from them, as from a thing diseased. And, perhaps, with houses the same principle is operative. And it is the aroma of evil deeds committed under a particular roof long after the actual doers have passed away that makes the goose flesh come and their hair rise. Something of the original passion of the evildoer and of the horror felt by its victim enter the heart of the innocent watcher, and he becomes suddenly conscious of tingling nerves, creeping skin, and a chilling of the blood. He is terror-stricken, 
without apparent cause. There was manifestly nothing in the external appearance of this particular house. To bear out the tales of the horror that was said to reign within, it was neither lonely nor unkempt. It stood crowded into a corner of the square, and it looked exactly like the houses on either side of it. It had the same number of windows as its neighbor, the same balcony overlooking the gardens, the same white steps leading up to the heavy black front door, and in the rear there was the same narrow strip of green, with neat box borders running up to the wall that divided it from the backs of the adjoining houses. Apparently, too, the number of chimney pots on the roof was the same, the breadth and angle of the eaves and and even the height of the dirty area railings. Yet this house in the square, that seemed precisely similar to its fifty ugly neighbors, was, as a matter of fact, entirely different. Horribly different. Wherein lay this marked invisible difference is impossible to say. It cannot be ascribed wholly to the imagination, because persons who had spent some time in the house, knowing nothing of the facts, had declared positively that certain rooms were so disagreeable, they would rather die than enter them again, and that the atmosphere of the whole house produced in them symptoms of genuine terror. While the series of innocent tenants who had tried to live in it and had been forced to decamp at the shortest possible notice was indeed little less than a scandal in the town. When Shorthouse arrived to pay a weekend visit to his Aunt Julia in her little house on the seafront at the other end of town, he found her charged to the brim with mystery and excitement. He had only received her telegram that morning, and he had come anticipating boredom. But the moment he touched her hand and kissed her apple-skin wrinkled cheek, he caught the first wave of her electrical condition. The impression deepened when he learned that there were to be no other visitors, in that he had been telegraphed for with a very special object. Something was in the wind, and the something would doubtless bear fruit for this elderly spinster aunt, with a mania for psychical research had brains as well as willpower, and by hook or by crook, she usually managed to accomplish her ends. The revelation was made soon after tea when she sidled up close to him as they paced slowly along the seafront in the dusk. I've got the keys, she announced it in a delighted yet half-awesome voice. Got them till Monday. The keys of the bathing machine, or... He asked innocently. Looking from the sea to the town, nothing brought her so quickly to the point as feigning stupidity. Neither, she whispered. I've got the keys of the haunted house in the square. I'm going there, tonight. Shorthouse was conscious of the slightest possible tremor down his back. He dropped his teasing tone. Something in her voice and manner thrilled him. She was in earnest. But you can't go alone, he began. That's why I wired for you, she said with decision. He turned to look at her. The ugly, lined, enigmatical face was alive with excitement. There was the glow of genuine enthusiasm round it like a halo. The eyes shone he caught another wave of her excitement, and a second tremor, more marked than the first, accompanied it. Th thanks, Aunt Julia, he said politely. Thanks, thanks awfully. I should not dare to go quite alone, she went on, raising her voice. But with you, I should enjoy it immensely. You're afraid of nothing, I know. Thanks so much, he said again. Um, is, is anything likely to happen? A great deal has happened, she whispered. Though it's been most cleverly hushed up, three tenants have come and gone in the last few months, and the house is said to be empty for good now. 
In spite of himself, Shorthouse became interested. His aunt was so very much in earnest. The house is very old indeed, she went on. And the story, an unpleasant one, dates a long way back. It has to do with a murder committed by a jealous stableman who had some affair with a servant in the house. One night, he managed to secrete himself in the cellar. And when everyone was asleep, he crept upstairs to the servant's quarters, chased the girl down to the next landing, and before anyone could come to the rescue, threw her body over the banisters into the hall below. And the stableman? He was caught, I believe, and he was hanged for murder. But it all happened a century ago, and I've not been able to get more details of the story. Shorthouse now felt his interest thoroughly aroused, but though he was not particularly nervous for himself, he hesitated a little on his aunt's account. Okay, on one condition, he said at length. Nothing will prevent my going, she said firmly, but I may as well hear your condition. That you guarantee your power of self-control if anything really horrible happens. I mean, that you are sure you won't get too frightened. Jim, she said scornfully. I'm not young, I know, nor are my nerves, but with you, I should be afraid of nothing in the world. This, of course, settled it, for Shorthouse had no pretensions to being other than a very ordinary young man, and an appeal to his vanity was irresistible. He agreed to go. Instinctively, by a sort of subconscious preparation, he kept himself and his forces well in hand the whole evening, compelling an accumulative reserve of control by that nameless inward process of gradually putting all the emotions away and turning the key upon them. A process difficult to describe, but wonderfully effective, as all men who have lived through severe trials of the inner man well understand. Later, it stood him in good stead. But it was not until half past ten, when they stood in the hall, well in the glare of friendly lamps, and still surrounded by comforting human influences, that he had to make the first call upon this store of collected strengths. For once the door was closed, and he saw the deserted silent street stretching away white in the moonlight before them, it came to him clearly that the real test that night would be in dealing with two fears instead of one. He would have to carry his aunt's fear as well as his own, and as he glanced down at her sphinx-like countenance, and realized that it might be no pleasant aspect in a rush of real terror. He felt satisfied with only one thing in the whole adventure, that he had confidence in his own will and power to stand against any shock that might come. Slowly, they walked along the empty streets of the town. A bright autumn moon silvered the roofs, casting deep shadows. There was no breath of wind, and the trees in the formal gardens by the seafront watched them silently as they passed along. To his aunt's occasional remarks, Shorthouse made no reply, realizing she was simply surrounding herself with mental buffers, saying ordinary things to prevent herself from thinking extraordinary things. Few windows showed lights, and from scarcely a single chimney came smoke or sparks. Shorthouse had already begun to notice everything, even the smallest details. Presently they stopped at the street corner and looked up at the name on the side of the house, full in the moonlight. And with one accord, but without remark, turned into the square and crossed over to the side of it that lay in shadow. The number of the house is thirteen, whispered a voice at his side, and neither of them made the obvious reference, but passed across the broad sheet of moonlight and began to march up the pavement in silence. 
It was about halfway up the square that Shorthouse felt an arm slipped quietly, but significantly into his own, and knew, then, that their adventure had begun in earnest, in that his companion was already yielding imperceptibility to the influences against them. She needed support. A few minutes later, they stopped before a tall, narrow house that rose before them in the night, ugly in shape, and painted a dingy white. Shutterless windows without blinds stared upon them, shining here and there in the moonlight. There were weather streaks in the wall and cracks in the paint, and the balcony bulged out from the first floor a little unnaturally. But beyond this generally forlorn appearance of an unoccupied house, there was nothing at first sight to single out this particular mansion. For the evil character, it had most certainly acquired. Taking a look over their shoulders to make sure they had not been followed, they went boldly up the steps and stood against the huge black door that fronted them forbiddingly. But the first wave of nervousness was now upon them, and Shorthouse fumbled a long time with the keys before he could fit it into the lock at all. For a moment, if truth were told, they both hoped it would not open, for they were a prey to various unpleasant emotions as they stood there on the threshold of their ghostly adventure. Shorthouse, shuffling with the key, and hampered by the steady weight on his arm, certainly felt the solemnity of the moment. It was as if the whole world, for all experience, seemed at that instant concentrated in his own consciousness, were listening to the grating noise of that key. A stray puff of wind wandering down the empty street woke a momentary rustling in the trees behind them. But otherwise, this rattling of the key was the only sound audible. And at last it turned in the lock, and the heavy door swung open and revealed a yawning gulf of darkness beyond. With a last glance of the moonlit square, they passed quickly in, and the door slammed behind them with a roar that echoed prodigiously through empty halls and passages. But instantly, with the echoes, another sound made itself heard, and Aunt Julia leaned suddenly so heavily upon him that he had to take a step backwards to save himself from falling. A man had coughed close beside them, so close that it seemed they must have been actually by his side, in the darkness. With the possibility of practical jokes in his mind, Shorthouse at once swung his heavy stick in the direction of the sound, but it meant nothing more solid than air. He heard his aunt give a little gasp beside him. There's, there's someone here, she whispered. I, I heard him. Be quiet, he said sternly. It was nothing but the sound of the front door. Get, get, get a light, get a light quick, she added, as her nephew, fumbling with a box of matches, opened it upside down and let them fall all with a rattle onto the stone floor. The sound, however, was not repeated, and there was no evidence of retreating footsteps. In another minute, they had a candle burning, using an empty end of a cigar case as a holder. And when the first flare had died down, he held the impromptu lamp aloft and surveyed the scene. And it was dreary enough in all conscience, for there is nothing more desolate in all the abodes of men than an unfurnished house dimly lit, silent, and forsaken. And yet tenanted by rumor, with the memories of evil and violent histories. They were standing in a wide hallway. On their left was the open door of a spacious dining room, and in front the hall ran, ever narrowing, 
into a long, dark passage that led, apparently, to the top of the kitchen stairs. The broad, uncarpeted staircase rose in a sweep before them, everywhere draped in shadows, except for a single spot, about halfway up, where the moonlight came in through the window and fell on a bright patch on the boards. This shaft of light shed a faint radiance above and below it, lending to the objects within its reach a misty outline that was infinitely more suggestive and ghostly than complete darkness. Filtered moonlight always seems to paint faces on the surrounding gloom, and as Shorthouse peered up into the well of darkness and thought of the countless empty rooms and passages in the upper part of the old house, he caught himself, longing again for the safety of the moonlit square, or the cozy bright drawing room they had left an hour before. Then realizing that these thoughts were dangerous, he thrust them away again and summoned all his energy for concentration on the present. Aunt Julia, he said aloud, severely. We must now go through the house from top to bottom and make a thorough search. The echoes of his voice died away slowly all over the building and in the intense silence that followed, he turned to look at her. In the candlelight, he saw that her face was already ghastly pale, but she dropped his arm for a moment and said in a whisper, stepping close in front of him, I agree. We must be sure there's no one hiding. That's the first thing. She spoke with evident effort, and he looked at her with admiration. You feel quite sure of yourself. It's, it's, it's not too late. I, I think so, she whispered, her eyes shifting nervously towards the shadows behind. Qu quite sure. O only one thing. What's that? You must never leave me alone for an instant. As long as you understand that any sound or appearance must be investigated at once, for to hesitate means to admit fear, and that is fatal. Okay, agreed, she said a little shakily. After a moment's hesitation, I I'll try. Arm in arm, Shorthouse holding the dripping candle and the stick while his aunt carried the cloak over her shoulders, figures of utter comedy to all but themselves. They began a systematic search. Stealthily walking on tiptoe and shading the candle, lest it should betray their presence through the shutterless windows, they went first into the big dining room. There was not a stick of furniture to be seen. Bare walls, ugly mantelpieces, and empty grates stared at them. Everything they felt resented their intrusion, watching them, as it were with veiled eyes. Whispers followed them. Shadows flitted noiselessly to right and left. Something seemed ever at their back, watching, waiting for an opportunity to do them injury. There was an inevitable sense that operations which went on when the room was empty had been temporarily suspended till they were well out of the way again. The whole dark interior of the old building seemed to become a malignant presence that rose up, warning them to desist and mind their own business. Every moment the strain on the nerves increased. Out of the gloomy dining room, they passed through large folding doors into a sort of library or smoking room, wrapped equally in silence, darkness, and dust. And from this, they regained the hall near the top of the back stairs. Here, a pitch black tunnel opened before them in the lower regions, and if it must be confessed, they hesitated, but only for a minute. With the worst of the night still to come, it was essential to turn from nothing. Aunt Julia stumbled at the top step of the dark descent, ill-lit by the flickering candle. 
And even Shorthouse felt at least half the decision go out of his legs. Come on, he said peremptorily, and his voice ran on and lost itself in the dark, empty spaces below. I'm coming. She faltered, catching his arm with unnecessary violence. They went a little unsteadily down the stone steps, a cold, damp air meeting them in the face, close and malodorous. The kitchen, into which the stairs led along a narrow passage, was large, with a lofty ceiling. Several doors opened out of it, some into cupboards with empty jars still standing on the shelves, and others into horrible little ghostly back offices, each colder and less inviting than the last. Black beetles scurried across the floor, and once, when they knocked against the deal table, standing in a corner, something about the size of a cat jumped down with a rush and fled, scampering across the stone floor into the darkness. Everywhere there was a sense of recent occupation, an impression of sadness and gloom. Leaving the main kitchen, they next went towards the scullery. The door was standing ajar, and as they pushed it open to its full extent, Aunt Julia uttered a piercing scream, which she instantly tried to stifle by placing her hand over her mouth. For a second, Shorthouse stood stock still, catching his breath. He felt as if his spine had suddenly become hollow and someone had filled it with particles of ice. Facing them, directly in their way, between the doorposts, stood the figure of a woman. She had disheveled hair and wildly staring eyes, and her face was terrified and white as death. It's only the the beastly jumping candlelight he said quickly, in a voice that sounded like someone else's and was only under half control. Come on, aunt. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. He dragged her forward. With a clattering of feet and a great appearance of boldness, they went on. But over his body the skin moved as if crawling ants covered it. And he knew, by the weight on his arm, that he was supplying the force of locomotion for the two. The scullery was cold, bare, and empty, more like a large prison cell than anything else. They went round it, tried the door into the yard and the windows, but found them all fastened securely. His aunt moved beside him like a person in a dream. Her eyes were tightly shut, and she seemed merely to follow the pressure of his arm. Her courage filled him with amazement. At the same time, he noticed that a certain odd change had come over her face, a change which somehow evaded his power of analysis. There's, there's nothing here, Auntie. He repeated aloud quickly. Let's, let's go upstairs. Let's see the rest of the house. Then we'll choose a room to wait up in. She followed him obediently keeping close to his side, and they locked the kitchen door behind them. It was a relief to get up again. In the hall, there was more light than before, for the moon had traveled a little further down than the stairs. Cautiously, they began to go up into the dark vault of the upper house, the boards creaking under their weight. On the first floor, they found the large double drawing rooms a search of which revealed nothing. Here also was no sign of furniture or recent occupancy, nothing but dust and neglect and shadows. They opened the big folding doors between front and back drawing rooms, and then came out again to the landing and went on upstairs. They had not gone up more than a dozen steps when they both simultaneously stopped to listen. Looking into each other's eyes, with a new apprehension across the flickering candle flame, from the room they had left hardly ten seconds before came the sound of doors 
quietly closing. It was beyond all question. They heard the booming noise that accompanies the shutting of heavy doors, followed by the sharp catching of the latch. We must go back and see, said Shorthouse briefly, in a low tone, and turning to go downstairs again. Somehow, she managed to drag after him, her feet catching in her dress, her face livid. When they entered the front drawing room, it was plain that the folding doors had been closed half a minute before. Without hesitation, Shorthouse opened them. He almost expected to see someone facing him in the back room, but only darkness and cold air met him. They went through both rooms, finding nothing unusual. They tried in every way to make the doors close of themselves, but there was not enough wind, even to set the candle flame flickering. The doors would not move without a strong pressure. All was silent as the grave. Undeniably, the rooms were utterly empty, and the house utterly still. It's beginning, whispered a voice at his elbow, which he hardly recognized as his aunt's. He nodded, acquiescence, taking out his watch to note the time. It was fifteen minutes before midnight. He made the entry of exactly what had occurred in his notebook, setting the candle in its case upon the floor in order to do so. It took a moment or two to balance it safely against the wall. Aunt Julia always declared that at this moment she was not actually watching him, but had turned her head towards the inner room where she fancied she heard something moving. But at any rate, both positively agreed that there came a sound of rushing feet, heavy and very swift. And the next instant, the candle was out. But to Shorthouse himself had come more than this, and he has always thanked his fortunate stars that it came to him alone, and not to his aunt too. For as he rose from the stooping position of balancing the candle, and before it was actually extinguished, a face thrust itself forward so close to his own that he could almost have touched it with his lips. It was a face working with passion, a man's face, dark with thick features and angry, savage eyes. It belonged to a common man, and it was evil in its ordinary normal expression, no doubt. But as he saw it, alive, with intense, aggressive emotion, it was a malignant and terrible human countenance. There was no movement of the air, nothing but the sound of rushing feet, stockinged or muffled feet. The apparition of the face and the almost simultaneous extinguishing of the candle. In spite of himself, Shorthouse uttered a little cry. What the? Nearly losing his balance as his aunt clung to him with her whole weight in one moment of real, uncontrollable terror. She made no sound, but simply seized him bodily. Fortunately, however, she had seen nothing, but had only heard the rushing feet for her control returned almost at once, and he was able to disentangle himself and strike a match. The shadows ran away on all sides before the glare, and his aunt stooped down and groped for the cigar case with the precious candle. Then they discovered that the candle had not been blown out at all. It had been crushed out. The wick was pressed down into the wax, which was flattened as if by some smooth, heavy instrument. How his companion so quickly overcame her terror, Shorthouse never properly understood. But his admiration for her self-control increased tenfold and at the same time served to feed his own dying flame, for which he was undeniably grateful. Equally inexplicable to him was the evidence of a physical force they had just witnessed. 
He at once suppressed the memory of stories he had heard of physical mediums and their dangerous phenomena. For, if these were true, and either his aunt or himself was unwittingly a physical medium, it meant that they were simply aiding to the focus the forces of a haunted house already charged to the brim. It was like walking with unprotected lamps among uncovered stores of gunpowder. So with as little reflection as possible, he simply relit the candle and went up to the next floor. The arm in his trembled, it is true, and his own tread was often uncertain. But they went on with thoroughness, and after a search revealing nothing, they climbed the last flight of stairs to the top floor of all. Here they found a perfect nest of small servants' rooms, with broken pieces of furniture, dirty cane-bottomed chairs, chests of drawers, cracked mirrors, and decrepit bedsteads. The rooms had low sloping ceilings, already hung here and there with cobwebs, small windows, and badly plastered walls. A depressing and dismal region which they were glad to leave behind. It was on the stroke of midnight when they entered a small room on the third floor, close to the top of the stairs, and arranged to make themselves comfortable for the remainder of their adventure. It was absolutely bare, and was said to be the room, then used as a clothes closet, into which the infuriated groom had chased his victim and finally caught her. Outside across the narrow landing began the stairs leading up to the floor above and the servants' quarters where they had just searched. In spite of the chillingness of the night, there was something in the air of this room that cried for an open window. But there was more than this. Shorthouse could only describe it by saying that he felt less master of himself here than in any part of the house. There was something that acted directly on the nerves, tiring the resolution and feebling the will. He was conscious of this result before he had been in the room five minutes, and it was in the short time they stayed there that he suffered the wholesale depletion of his vital forces, which was, for himself, the chief horror of the whole experience. They put the candle on the floor of the cupboard, leaving the door a few inches ajar, so that there was no glare to confuse the eyes and no shadow to shift about on walls and ceiling. Then they spread the cloak on the floor and sat down to wait with their backs against the wall. Shorthouse was within two feet of the door onto the landing his position commanded a good view of the main staircase leading down into the darkness, and also of the beginning of the servant's stairs going to the floor above. The heavy stick lay beside him within easy reach. The moon was now high above the house. Through the open window they could see the comforting stars like friendly eyes watching in the sky. One by one, the clocks of the town struck midnight. And when the sounds died away, the deep silence of a windless night fell again over everything. Only the boom of the sea, far away and lugubrious, filled the air with hollow murmurs. Inside the house, the silence became awful. Awful, he thought, because any minute now, it might be broken by sounds portending terror. The strain of waiting told more and more severely on the nerves. They talked in whispers when they talked at all, for their voices aloud sounded queer and unnatural. A chilliness not altogether due to the night air invaded the room and made them cold. The influences against them, whatever these might be, were slowly robbing them of self-confidence. In the power of decisive action, their forces were on the wane, and the possibility of real fear to 
took on a new and terrible meaning. He began to tremble for the elderly woman by his side, whose pluck could hardly save her beyond a certain extent. He heard the blood singing in his veins. It sometimes seemed so loud that he fancied it prevented his hearing properly certain other sounds that were beginning to very faintly make themselves audible in the depths of the house. Every time he fastened his attention on these sounds, they instantly ceased. They certainly came no nearer. Yet, he could not rid himself of the idea that movement was going on somewhere in the lower regions of the house. The drawing room floor where the doors had been so strangely closed seemed too near. The sounds were further off than that. He thought of the great kitchen with the scurrying black beetles and of the dismal little scullery. But somehow or other, they did not seem to come from there either. Surely they were not outside the house. Then suddenly, the truth flashed into his mind, and for the space of a minute, he felt as if his blood had stopped flowing and turned to ice. The sounds were not downstairs at all. They were upstairs. Upstairs, somewhere among those horrid, gloomy little servants' rooms with their bits of broken furniture, low ceilings and crammed windows. Upstairs, where the victim had first been disturbed and stalked to her death. And in the moment he discovered where the sounds were, he began to hear them more clearly. It was the sound of feet moving stealthily along the passage overhead, in and out among the rooms and past the furniture. He turned quickly to steal a glance at the motionless figure seated beside him to note whether she had shared his discovery. The faint candlelight coming through the crack in the cupboard door threw her strongly marked face into vivid relief against the white of the wall. But it was something else that made him catch his breath and stare again. An extraordinary something had come into her face and seemed to spread over her features like a mask. It smoothed out the deep lines and drew the skin everywhere a little tighter so that the wrinkles disappeared. It brought into the face, with the sole exception of the old eyes, an appearance of youth and almost of childhood. He stared in speechless amazement, amazement that was dangerously near to horror. It was his aunt's face indeed. But it was her face of forty years ago, the vacant, innocent face of a girl. He had heard stories of that strange effect of terror which could wipe a human countenance clean of other emotions, obliterating all previous expressions. But he had never realized that it could be literally true, or could mean anything so simply horrible as what he now saw. For the dreadful signature of overmastering fear was written plainly in that utter vacancy of the girlish face beside him. And when, feeling his intense gaze, she turned to look at him, he instinctively closed his eyes tightly to shut out the sight. Yet, when he turned a minute later, his feelings well in hand, he saw to his intense relief another expression. His aunt was smiling, and though the face was deathly white, the awful veil had lifted, and the normal look was returning. Anything wrong was all he could think of to say at the moment, and the answer was eloquent, coming from such a woman. I, I feel cold and a little frightened she whispered. He offered to close the windows, but she seized hold of him and begged him not to leave her side even for an instant. It's, it's upstairs, I know, she whispered with an odd laugh, but I can't possibly go up. But Shorthouse thought otherwise, 
knowing that in action lay their best hope of self-control. He took out the brandy flask and poured out a glass of neat spirit, stiff enough to help anybody over anything. She swallowed it with a little shiver. His only idea now was to get out of the house before her collapse became inevitable. But this could not safely be done by turning tail and running from the enemy. Inaction was no longer possible. Every minute he was growing less master of himself and desperate. Aggressive measures were imperative without further delay. Moreover, the action must be taken towards the enemy, not away from it. The climax, if necessary and unavoidable, would have to be faced boldly. He could do it now, but in ten minutes he might not have the force left to act for himself, much less for both. Upstairs the sounds were meanwhile becoming louder and closer, accompanied by occasional creaking of the boards. Something was moving stealthily about, stumbling now and then awkwardly against the furniture. Waiting a few moments to allow the tremendous dose of spirits to produce its effect, and knowing this would last but a short time under the circumstances, Shorthouse then quietly got on his feet, saying in a determined voice, Now, Aunt Julia, we'll go upstairs and find out what all this noise is about. You must come too. It's what we agreed. He picked up his stick and went to the cover for the candle. A limp form rose shakily beside him, breathing hard. And he heard a voice say very faintly something about being ready to come. The woman's courage amazed him. It was so much greater than his own, and as they advanced, holding aloft the dripping candle, some subtle force exhaled from this trembling white-faced old woman at his side. That was the true source of his inspiration. It held something really great that shamed him, and gave him the support without which he would have proved far less equal to the occasion. They crossed the dark landing, avoiding with their eyes the deep black space over the banisters. Then they began to mount the narrow staircase to meet the sounds, which minute by minute grew louder and nearer. About halfway up the stairs, Aunt Julia stumbled, and Shorthouse turned to catch her by the arm. And just at that moment, there came a terrific crash in the servant's corridor overhead. It was instantly followed by a shrill, agonized scream that was a cry of terror and a cry for help melted into one. Before they could move aside or go down a single step, someone came rushing along the passage overhead, blundering horribly, racing madly at full speed, three steps at a time, down the very staircase where they stood. The steps were light and uncertain, but close behind them sounded the heavier tread of another person, and the staircase seemed to shake. Shorthouse and his companion just had time to flatten themselves against the wall when the jumble of flying steps was upon them, and two persons, with the slightest possible interval between them, dashed past at full speed. What the hell? It was a perfect whirlwind of sound breaking in upon the midnight silence of the empty building. The two runners pursuer and pursued had passed clean through them where they stood, and already with a thud the boards below had received the first one, then the other. Yet they had seen absolutely nothing, not a hand or arm or face, or even a shred of flying clothing. There came a second's pause, then the first one, the lighter of the two, obviously the pursued one, ran with uncertain footsteps into the little room which Shorthouse and his aunt had just left. The heavier one followed. There was a sound of scuffling, gasping, 
and smothered screaming. And then out onto the landing came the step of a single person treading weightily. A dead silence followed for the space of a half a minute. And then was heard a rushing sound through the air. It was followed by a dull crashing thud in the depths of the house below, on the stone floor of the hall. Utter silence reigned after. Nothing moved. The flame of the candle was steady. It had been steady the whole time, and the air had been undisturbed by any movement whatsoever. Palsied with terror, Aunt Julia, without waiting for her companion, began fumbling her way downstairs. She was crying gently to herself, and when Shorthouse put his arm around her and half carried her, he felt that she was like a trembling leaf. He went into the little room and picked up the cloak from the floor, and arm in arm, walking very slowly, without speaking a word or looking once behind them. They marched down the three flights into the hall. In the hall they saw nothing, but the whole way down the stairs they were conscious that someone had followed them step by step. When they went faster, it was left behind, and when they went more slowly, it caught up. But never once did they look behind to see, and at each turning of the staircase they lowered their eyes for fear of the following horror they might see upon the stairs above. With trembling hands, Shorthouse opened the front door, and they walked out into the moonlight and drew a deep breath of the cool night air blowing in from the sea. The House with the Painted Doors by L. Chan Narrated by Otis Gyrie The doctor told me it was a figment of my imagination, a hallucination, a phantom limb, cut off, but the ghost of a feeling remains. The doctor tooted and prescribed me a different pill. I've lost count of how many pills I've tried. There was the yellow one, and the red and white capsule, and the green one. They have succeeded in giving me incontinence, nausea, and hair loss. But they haven't taken away my girl. My doctor told me to talk about it. Tell people. What the hell am I supposed to tell something like this? My last friends abandoned me when Sylvia left. It's late here. It's just me and no sleep. Where to start? Oh, where there's so much to tell. At the beginning, I suppose, it's always a good place. We thought we had it made when we moved into the suburbs. We had well-paying jobs. Fluke or competence had saved us when the waves of cuts hit around 2010. For once in our lives, money wasn't a problem. Eight years earlier, we had Annabelle, Belle for short. She was our little angel. Parents out there will know. A child shifts the center of gravity of your life. The move was good for her. Good for us, away from the bustle and hustle and danger of the city. Busy streets, missing children, the sticky hands and staring eyes of sexual predators. It wasn't the house of our dreams, but it was close enough. A lawn for the balmy summer months, fireplace for the chill of winter, space for us to grow into, especially for a young girl. It came fully furnished, and it was a steal. A distressed sale, our agent called it, at least a tenth off with a similar property would set us back. The euphoria and novelty lasted me till the first night. 
Sylvia was asleep next to me. The moonlight sparkled off the fine hairs of her bare shoulder. We shared a celebratory drink after dinner, and then after that, another. And I was lying in bed, basking in the warm glow of alcohol, when I first heard it. My first thought was rats. That was exactly what it sounded like, the little tap dance of tiny claws on hardwood coming from the walls. The delicate snoring from next to me told me that Sylvia was undisturbed by the scratching noise coming from the walls. I flinched as my bare feet touched the cold floor. The floorboards groaned in protest as I padded across the room like an overweight ninja. The tapping paused at the first creak of the floorboards, then resumed. The rough weave of the wallpaper under my palm as I leaned in to track the pitter-patter behind the walls. Scampering sounds eluded me. Every time I attempted to track the rats, the sounds seemed to come from another part of the room. My knees grew sore from pressure. I wasn't some young child at a playground. I was a grown man, and my weight pressed down on the bony points of my kneecaps. Out of desperation, I put my ear to the wall, hoping that the source of the little noises would reveal itself to me. I was only met with a stubborn silence, or almost a stubborn silence. On the edge of my hearing, so quiet that I had to strain my ears to pick it up, a child's laughter from inside the walls. I did not speak of the incident. I spent more time trying to convince myself that there hadn't been that childish giggle. Wind, perhaps. The rattle of a toy. Not a rattle. Maybe one of those newfangled dolls with those soulless eyes and microchip voice. There was a change in her, like the heavy air you can smell before a thunderstorm. She was a little quieter than usual. A strange environment will do that to a kid. A little withdrawn. Sylvia didn't really notice. I suppose I'd always been more observant than her. Belle started looking tired, dark crescents appearing under her light hazel eyes. She wasn't getting much sleep. My first instinct was to blame the rats in the walls. Who wouldn't? They got louder and louder as the days went by. The damn things were keeping me up at night. It seemed that the sounds progressed from simple scratchings to thumps almost as though the cursed rodents were hurling themselves bodily against my walls. The thumping started sounding eerily like footsteps. I was not about to be defeated by a group of jumped-up rats in my own house. Fueled by testosterone-induced rage, I waged war. I tried glue traps. I tried poison. I tried cages. Nothing worked. I asked Sylvia about it, but she seemed oblivious to the late-night disturbances. That woman could sleep through a hurricane. I asked Belle if the noise was keeping her up at night. Sylvia was over in the living room, watching TV, while Belle and I did the dishes. She just looked up with those big eyes of hers. The other children want to come in and play, but they can't open the door. The girl always had an overactive imagination, but this one hit a little too close to home for me. I felt the unfamiliar prickle of goose flesh on my arm. You mean the door to the house, I asked, keeping my tone deliberately playful. It was a game, just another of her little games. I had imaginary friends at that age. Why should my own child have been any different? No, Daddy. The door behind the cupboard. The opening theme from Desperate Housewives floated up through the floorboards, a world away. I thought I'd humor my little girl, but there was something deathly serious in her tone that I could not shake. I reached back around the standalone wardrobe and felt nothing more than the smooth paint on the wall. There's no door there, honey. Look closer, she insisted. I held up my cell phone for light, still playing along. There was something strange in that. Palm width of space between the cupboard and the wall. A discoloration of the wall, perhaps something darker in the shade of the wardrobe. The hard edges of the wardrobe bit into the soft flesh of my fingers. I put my back into it, and a piece of furniture gave ground grudgingly. And there it was. A door behind the wardrobe, just as Belle had said. Not any door, though. I ran my fingers over the smooth surface of a wall. 
just a painted one. So convincing were the brush strokes on the door that I had to touch the wall again to tell myself that it wasn't real. How'd you know this was here, baby bear? I asked. The other children told me. From school. As far as I knew, she hadn't brought friends home before. No, Daddy, the children from behind the door, she said. I looked into her tawny eyes, hoping to spot some twinkle of mischief there. There was nothing there but an innocent earnestness. I lay in bed that night, studying the cracks in the ceiling. My heart pounded hard in my chest, a heavy bass line above the distant rumble of the heating. My daughter's words had unsettled me in a strange way I could not pinpoint. It felt off, somehow, like a surrealist painting, one tiny detail throwing my carefully ordered world into disarray. I took no deep breaths, trying to drive away that strange, tight fear in my chest. The odd painted door, a mural of some sort? Why was it still there when the room had been so clearly repainted? The thumping of the rats in the walls sounding so much like little footsteps. The children from behind the door, she said. I rubbed at my forearms vigorously, trying to press the goosebumps back down into my skin. That's when the thumping started again. Not rats, I realized. Not rats at all. Footsteps. The light bounce of a child. I crept up to my wall again, pressing my ear against the wallpaper. There was laughter there, faint and soft. Not the laughter of a single child. Children. Their happy footfalls beating a rough drumbeat on the wooden floor. There was someone else in there with my daughter. My heart jumped. I felt the chill in my veins as I rushed out of my room and tore down the corridor. The silvery light of the moon shone through the window. It gave everything an odd, flat look, without contrast. Belle's room was only a few feet from the door to our bedroom, but my chest heaved with deep, body-shaking breaths. I could still hear them faintly through the door, the thud of their feet on the floor. I steeled myself. It was nothing. Sound traveled strangely through these old houses. Echoes, maybe. She was just talking to herself in her sleep, the stress of moving, perhaps. Suitably calmed, I turned the doorknob slowly. There was a conspiratorial shush from the other side of the door, and silence descended like a shroud. I gave the door a gentle push. The room was dark and quiet. The moonlight crept into the room. My daughter was standing there, just behind the door, a still figure against a dark background. The shock took the strength from my legs. I backed away a little quicker than I meant to. She stood there, swaying slightly. Thin white crescents showed from under her hooded eyelids. Her lips were moving, almost soundlessly. I leaned forward, straining to make out what she was saying. It slowly became clear, one sentence, over and over. All of the doors are open now. All of the doors are open. And from behind her, in the shadowed room, the quiet click of a door shutting. Bell didn't recall a thing the next morning. She could sense my frustration and fear as I quizzed her about the night before. Dark circles framed puzzled eyes in her pale face. She hadn't slept well that night either. Sylvia took her to school. I hadn't broached the topic with Sylvia yet. There was still some time before I had to leave for the office. I crept back into my daughter's room, feeling like a thief in my own empty house. I stood there in front of that strange painted door for the second time in as many days. I ran my fingers around its edges, remembering the strange sound of the door shutting from the night before. Its edges were wholly contiguous with the wall. I pulled the wardrobe out further, putting my entire frame between the wardrobe and the door and leaning into it. There was no give, no yielding of the door. It was just painted over a wall as solid as any other. I was about to go when I heard an unfamiliar rasp under my foot. The floor was gritty with some kind of dust. I knelt down and pinched some of the dust up between two fingers. All the doors are open now. My daughter's dreamy voice in my ear, my memory of it so sharp that it seemed that she was right there whispering it. How odd it was for the dust to be pink. Of course it would be. 
It wasn't dust at all. It was paint. Paint from the wall. Things didn't get better. The gambling footsteps continued at night, unabated. That and the whispers and the giggles at night. Whatever was in my daughter's room toyed with me. It never let Sylvia hear it. I'd stay up, waiting to wake my wife up just in time to hear it, only to be met with a stubborn silence. Trickery wouldn't work either. We stayed up late to catch a DVD long into the small hours of the night, but the house remained quiet. The laughter from the next room was always tantalizingly distant. The happy sounds of children at play, as though from a great distance. Too great a distance to be in the room next to mine. Belle was in high spirits, but she was wasting away. Sylvia hadn't noticed it yet, but I felt it in the sharp bones of her shoulders, pressing into my arms when I hugged her. Or her skinny arms that I could almost encircle with my thumb and forefinger. I received an email from her teacher, mentioning that Belle still wasn't integrating well at school. He said that Belle was perpetually tired in class, and she had blamed late-night games of tag and hide-and-seek with her friends for her tiredness. You need to exercise more control over your girl, he said. I had to know what was going on. Sylvia was already asleep. The nightly visits hadn't started yet. I slid into Belle's room silently, an open packet of flour in my hand. I scattered it all around the floor, taking care not to step into the flour myself. I lay back in my bed with a sigh, waiting for the sounds to start. Sleep took me unexpectedly, but what little I had was fitful and restless. I woke with a snort at first light. It was Saturday, and it would be some time yet before the rest of the world woke. I stretched under the covers, my back popping satisfyingly. I blinked the sleep from my eyes. The flower. I had to check the flower. I swung my feet off the bed and planted them on the floor, right next to a pair of white speckled footprints, just where they would be if someone was standing over my bed, staring at me. That damnable chill stole the warmth of the morning sun from my skin. My hands clenched and unclenched spastically, like dying spiders. I stared at the trail of flower-marked footprints from my open door. How long had she stood there, in the dark, watching me sleep, I wondered. I stood up on shaky legs, my hand on the wall to support myself down the corridor. Bell's door was ajar and swung open silently. The sound of deep breathing told me that Bell was still asleep. There was but a single set of footprints, just starting from her bed, where her feet would have landed if she got off. No multiple footprints, just a single set for my daughter. Typical somnambulism, perhaps. The stress of the move, the new school, could have brought it on. She'd never sleepwalked before, but who knew what dark things lurked in her psyche. I heaved a sigh of relief, chastising myself for a week's worth of irrationality. How reassuring the illusion of normalcy in our lives, and how quickly it shatters. Not with a roar or a flash, with something simple. Something simple, like my daughter's shoe, bouncing off my toe as I tried to leave the room. Flipping once, twice, and coming to rest, to a hollow in the flower on the floor. The size, the shoe, the prints. It didn't fit, it didn't match. Whatever had gotten off the bed had stood next to me the night before. It wasn't Belle. After that cruel prank, the noises at night returned unabated. The strangeness started to leak. The night was no longer its sole province. I was waiting for Belle outside the upstairs toilet another Saturday morning when I heard the familiar taunting voices start up over the sound of the shower a chorus of children's voices saying something with a strange cadence, a chant, almost. Stay. They seemed to say, Stay. 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 They were in there. There was no way for them to escape. I found the door unlocked. I turned the knob, braced my legs, and threw the door open. and found nothing. Hot water still gushed from the shower head. Steam billowed out into the cooler air of the corridor. No one was there. I'd seen her go in. I would have wagered my life on it. And yet she was gone. The giggling started again coming down the corridor, mocking. 
her room. I bolted down the corridor. I found her there, a towel wrapped around her bare body, staring at me with a cold mirth from her bed. Her dripping hair had left a trail of water on the wooden floor, a trail which led to the wall with the painted door. I felt her eyes trailing me as I left the room. I shut the shower off, looking for how my daughter and the voices had escaped the tiny toilet. It took a minute. Like the picture with the young lady that turned into an old crone, the answer was right there in front of me. Sketched out between the towels in front of me, in bold strokes of dark mildew, was the vague outline of a door. It was another sleepless night. I thought long and hard about trying to explain everything to Sylvia. It sounded crazy. There were doors in the walls. Doors that our daughter had walked through. Doors led in something strange into our house. Something that wanted her to stay. The thought lingered in the back of my head like a superlative scab, itchy and red and raw. Sleep would not come easy. I was contemplating a little chemical assistance to aid me along my way when I grew aware of a soft sliding sound. Movement caught my eye. I saw a slim figure slowly shuffle by the door to our bedroom. Bell, I called out to her softly. She didn't break step. And what a step it was, a stiff-armed and stiff-legged march down the corridor, her feet scraping over the wooden floor. Bell, I called out, a little louder. There was no response. I got out of bed and tiptoed to the door. The door to the toilet clicked shut softly. I followed. The lights revealed an empty corridor. The toilet door yielded a squeak of complaint. The silence was thick and cloying. It seemed that no sound would carry through the air. The light clicked to life in the toilet. Shadows leapt and danced with its first few flickers. The shower curtain swayed. The draft I had let in when I opened the door, I told myself. It did not help. I chided myself for my childish fears, but the flutter in my gut remained. I yanked the curtain aside roughly. My other hand balled into a fist to protect myself. From what? My daughter? Nothing awaited me on the other side of the curtain. Nothing but that strange outline of a door etched out in lines with tiles. I heaved a sigh of relief. Perhaps the lack of sleep was getting me. My fear is spilling into waking dreams. The calm was short-lived. I heard another door slam shut. Downstairs. A series of childish titters carried up through the floorboards. I bolted downstairs. Again, the lights revealed nothing, almost nothing. The huge throw rug that had come with the furnished house had been tossed aside. There, hidden under it, was another door, scratched into the parquet flooring. I felt sick to my stomach, thinking of the days we spent on the couch with our feet on that hideous thing. I ran my fingers around the grooves of the thin grooves of the scratch marks. The door felt cool to the touch, cooler than the surrounding wood. The same feel of a front door guarding against the winter chill. Whatever it was that the door guarded against, it was cold, very cold. The laughter started again, taunting, mocking. I heard the creak of my daughter's footsteps on the stairs to the basement. The light of the living room seemed to shy away from the depths of the basement. I could make out Belle's outline just where the light of the living room met the darkness of the basement. The light switch was at the foot of the stairs. The steps sagged under my weight. Belle didn't turn around. I reached out to grab her shoulder. Her bony shoulder was icy cold. I pulled her towards me. I could just nearly see her face. Something blotted out the light. I blinked at the silhouette at the top of the staircase. Daddy, why are all the lights on? Belle's voice. Oh, God. Belle was at the top of the stairs. I felt the light caress of fingers on my hand, the girl in front of me, her fingers on mine. Her voice was a hoarse whisper, as though forced from a throat long turned to dust. She's ours now. She giggled and twisted away from my grasp, vanishing into the dark. 
The dark space under the house suddenly filled with a patter of feet on the dusty floor. Two pairs, three pairs, until it seemed that an entire legion of light feet were dancing across the floor. The sound was deafening in that confined space. I reached forward and thumbed a light switch, only to be greeted by silence and the slowly settling dust. Something was wrong with the wall again. I already knew what to expect. With a sweep of my hand, I cleared the dust from the wall. Just as I expected, another door. This one, a huge set of double doors, painted on the wall with garish colors. Just before I left the basement, I saw the clean circles on the floor where the opening had just swept the dust away. We had to go. There was something dark in the house, something wholly unnatural about those strange painted doors. I sprinted up the stairs. Grab some clothes, I told Belle as I passed her. I did not stop to see if there was a shred of understanding in her blank eyes. She turned and followed me silently upstairs. I shook Sylvia awake roughly. Four weeks to the day we moved in, and we were fleeing our own home. She blinked asleep from her eyes. In hushed tones, I tried to explain the situation to her. The painted doors, the sound of children, the danger we were all in. Her expression slowly changed from sleepy bewilderment to one of disbelief and annoyance. She told me that I was overreacting and that the stress of the move and our job was taking its toll on me. We would talk about it in the morning, she said. Get help from a doctor if we needed to. I grew increasingly agitated at her apathy. I begged her to humor me for just one night, for our family to shift to a motel for a single evening. Her conversation grew heated. All this was cut short when Belle reappeared at our doorway. Her hair was wild, her eyes burning with some inner fire. You should go now. All the doors are closing soon. I must stay with them. Her voice was toneless, the flat delivery of an atheist reciting a litany. Sylvia gaped. Having her daughter acting as strangely as her husband tipped her over the edge. Weeping, she rushed forward and held Belle close to her. You're not going anywhere. This isn't real. Daddy's sick. He's made you sick, too. You and I will get away from here. Get away from Daddy. Those words felt like physical blows. I felt sick. My wife started pulling at Belle's hand, trying to move her. Belle stood fast, and there was nothing my wife, with her advantages and strength and weight, could do to shift her an inch. Sensing their prey about to invade them, the things in the house grew restless. Our rooms filled with the sound of feet on the floor, the sound of little feet running up and down the corridors. With a squeak, Sylvia pulled the door shut and leaned against it. The door shuddered on its hinges as unseen things flung themselves against it. Unsuccessful, the house grew silent. Sylvia stared at the doorknob. I shook my head, stepping off the bed. I had just gotten onto my feet when a new horror showed itself. Our wall was stretching, distending like a boil, bulging obscenely toward us. There was a door in our room, under the wallpaper. It had been there all along. Sylvia began to sob, big, hiccuping sobs of fear. We heard the tearing sound of the glue ripping off the walls. The blister of the wall took shape. I saw the hard edge of the door pressing, straining against the wallpaper. And behind that, the sharp points of fingers pressing against outwards. Many, many pairs of hands, and then a rip. A pale finger burst through the thick wallpaper. It hooked downwards and began to tear at the fabric. Sylvia and I were transformed by the sight, paralyzed by fear. Sylvia screamed as Belle tore herself free from her mother's grasp. Belle took another step forward and placed her hand on the light switch. In that moment, I saw my daughter again. For the last time. Her eyes sparkled with tears. Don't look. You don't want to see them. I love you. With a flick of her wrist, she plunged the room into total darkness. The sound of the wallpaper ripping was very loud. The temperature in the room fell. It felt larger somehow, that we weren't in the bedroom of our home anymore, but in some vast and empty space. A chill wind blew, and it smelt of dry dust. When the wind died down, we were alone in our room. Our girl was gone.
What is there left to say after that? We did what we could. We moved into a motel. The police came. They looked for prints. They asked questions. They took pictures. They broke down the walls behind the doors with their hammers. Nothing. The detectives came. They asked more questions. Hard questions, sometimes. They took me away for a while. The doctors came. They cajoled and counseled. They asked me about my parents, about our family, if I had ever hurt my daughter. The doctors found nothing wrong with me. The cops found nothing in my house. The detectives found nothing false in our story. They let me go. Sylvia and I stayed with her parents for a month. Belle's disappearance ripped a hole in our lives. We tried. Some things just don't heal, right? Other things don't heal at all. Things just weren't the same. The split was amicable. We just drifted. No arguments, no fights. Just a slow death of the love that had once bound us. And what then? I came back here. There was nowhere else I could go. The first night was the hardest. The bedroom was out of the question. I spent the first night on the couch, hugging a bottle of Jack. It was midnight when the laughter woke me. They were still there in the house. Through the tinkling of the laughter, I could pick out just one single voice. A father never forgets the voice of his child. The doors were gone, but they were still there. She was still there. I'll stop here for the night. I can hear her again. She sounds happy. A Figure in the Fog by Michael Shadow Swimmer 77 Landry. The town of Arthur's Wake was dying. At least that's what Jamie's dad always said. The man tended to wax philosophical when he was drunk, which was often. Jamie would silently sit at the dinner table and listen to the man ramble on about how things had been different when he'd been growing up, how back then an honest day's work actually got you something. James' mother would sit silently at the other end of the table from his father, saying nothing, gaze firmly fixed on an empty space six inches in front of her face, only stirring to refill plates or glasses or to clear the dishes. Many days her unmoving hollow eyes were ringed with various shades of purple and yellow. On those they weren't, the bruises were simply hiding, concealing themselves in places less visible. Once, last year, his father had been in a particularly black drunk. Profits at the factory were down. Rumor had it that the foreman would be releasing a handful of workers by the end of the week, and Jamie's dad reckoned he might be one of them. Jamie had lain in the bedroom he shared with his brother, staring at the ceiling for as long as he was able, tears quietly streaming down his face, listening to the shouts through the thin walls, accompanied by heavy thumps and soft moans. Finally, unable to bear the sounds any more, he got out of bed and retrieved his little league bat from where it rested in the corner. He made it to the door when he felt a small hand tug on his pajama sleeve. Jamie, don't go, Jamie. Shut up, Lester. No, no, Jamie, don't leave me. Get off. Jamie, he'll hurt you. Get off me. Go hide in the closet if you're scared. No, no, no. Jamie pulled his sleeve from Lester's grip and gave him a slight shove, enough to knock him back onto the bed. The little boy sat there, pitifully sobbing as Jamie slipped through the door. Noiselessly, he crept down the hallway toward the living room, holding the bat, cocked the way his coach had taught. Jamie carefully poked his head around the corner, eyes growing wide at the scene that had unfolded before him. His father stood in the middle of the room, a half-empty beer can in one hand, his belt in the other. His mother cowered in the far corner, hands held feebly in front of her, one eye already swollen shut. A red rage overtook Jamie, the emotion more powerful than anything he'd felt in his young life. In that moment, he made the decision to kill his father. He held his breath stalking ever closer to the man that 
took a long pull from his drink. Whether he was warned by the slight widening of his wife's good eye or through some devilish intuition, Jamie's father turned just as Jamie raised his weapon. Screaming in anger and frustration, Jamie swung as hard as he could, only to have the bat plucked from his hands as easily as a child pulling the wings off of a fly. You little shit. The slap hit Jamie hard enough to see stars, his head snapping backwards, and he stumbled against the wall. The next blow crushed the air from his chest, and he crumpled to the ground, gasping for breath. Think you're man enough to take a swing at me, huh? Jamie tasted blood and heard a dull crack when his father kicked him in the ribs. He curled into a ball as the blows continued to fall. See how you like the taste of your own medicine, boy. Jamie raised his arm to defend himself as the bat came down, smashing against his forearm. He screamed as he felt the bone snap. Don't, huh? We're just getting started. Jamie's eyes widened in terror as his father raised the bat above his head, ready to deliver a crushing blow. Suddenly his mother was there, pinning Jamie to the ground, shielding him with her own body. Frank, you fucking animal, it's your son. Get out of the way, whore, the boy's gonna learn. You'll have to kill me first. Go ahead and do it, and enjoy being locked up for the rest of your miserable life, you piece of shit. You think I won't? I know you won't. You don't have the balls. For a moment, Jimmy thought he would do it, with the bat wavering ever so slightly as his father's eyes narrowed in drunken rage. Then he lowered the bat and turned his back on the huddled pair. Fucking bitch. He walked across the room to where the television blared loudly and dropped into an easy chair, tossing the bat into the corner. His mother slowly got to her feet. He needs to go to the hospital, Frank, and fucking take him. She helped Jamie up. Get to the car and lock yourself in, baby. I'll get your brother and meet you there. They drove to the hospital in silence, save for Lester's quiet sniffles from the back seat. Jamie's arm had to be set and put into a cast. The brake was clean, so the doctor assured them it would heal without any issues. They also tightly wrapped his chest in medical tape, though fortunately the ribs were just cracked and bruised, not broken. Jamie lay slightly dozing in a hospital bed. Lester curled up under his unbroken arm fast asleep, while his mother spoke softly to a woman in the hallway. They talked for a while, ever so often shooting concerned glances at him through the doorway. Finally, his mother came into the room and gently sat down next to him. Who's that lady, Mom? No one, honey. She's just worried about how you got your injuries and how I got mine. What'd you tell her? What I had to. Jamie grit his teeth in frustration. Why do you stay with him, Mom? We could leave. His mother smiled sadly. You'll understand someday. Now you have to promise me something, no matter what happens. Never try to do what you did tonight again. But I mean it, Jamie. I would die if anything happened to you or your brother. I can take care of myself. You just have to trust me, babe. Lying there in the dark, feeling the slow rise and fall of his brother's chest as he softly snored beside him, Jamie lied to his mother for the first and only time in his life. All right, Mom. I promise. A nurse came in and adjusted a knob on one of the tubes leading into his arm. Jamie felt his eyelids grow heavy as his mother stroked his forehead. That's my brave boy. My brave, beautiful boy. Well, Jamie thought to himself as he drifted to sleep, it might not really be a lie. I said I wouldn't try again. Next time I just have to succeed. Jamie had slowly healed over the coming weeks. His arm itched under the cast, but the worst part was the cracked ribs, which ached constantly and sent sharp pains running through his side whenever he took a deep breath. One night he lay in bed, fitfully trying to get comfortable when the dark shape of his father loomed over him from the doorway. Terrified, he remained absolutely still, feigning sleep. 
To his surprise, the man sat down next to him, quietly weeping. Oh, my boy, my boy, I'm so sorry. He stayed there for several minutes. Jamie, trying desperately not to gasp from the pain radiating from his ribs. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Jamie's mother stood in the doorway. I, no, you don't get to feel sorry for this. You don't get to touch him. Please, Mary. Don't you fucking dare. You're not his father. Not after what you did. If you touch either of them again, for any reason. I'm leaving you, Frank, and I'm taking them with me. Now get out. Shoulders hunched, his father stumbled from the room, closing the door behind him. It was a long time before Jamie managed to fall asleep. Since then, Jamie had been waiting for an opportunity to kill his father. He'd come close a few times, evenings when his father would be passed out in front of the TV, a line of drool slowly dripping down his chin. But something always held him back. Jamie told himself it was the promise he made to his mother, but the small, honest part of his mind knew it was because he was afraid. He still remembered the pain. For his father's part, he hadn't touched Jamie or Lester since that night. It probably helped that somehow he managed to avoid the layoffs at the factory. Certainly, he still got drunk regularly, and on many occasions would slap his wife around. But things never got quite as bad as that time. There was less shouting involved now. The abuse had become almost a casual action, done out of reflex rather than emotion. Jimmy's anger had cooled from the burning rage it was when he made the decision to kill his father to a low, calculating heat. He was patient, and he watched, knowing that someday he would have his moment. Until then, Jimmy spent his evenings numbly sitting at the dinner table, listening to his drunk of a father go on about the good old days. Lester at least seemed to be oblivious to the dark undercurrents in the house. Even now, the eight-year-old was making faces across the table at Jamie, trying to get him to laugh. Jamie thought about trying to kick him under the table, but he decided not to. He didn't want to draw attention to himself. This town is going to hell, I tell you, his father spoke between bites of roast. Unemployment through the roof, homeless bums passed out on every other street corner. He took a swig of beer, and don't even get me started about all the disappearing kids. That little Fontaine girl's the latest one last week. Her dad stopped by the factory today out of his goddamn mind. Jamie felt a hollow pit appear in his stomach as his mind registered what his father had just said. He spoke up without thinking. What? Morgan's missing? Hmm? His father frowned. No, not Morgan. The other one, the sister, Claire. Relief washed over Jamie, quickly followed by shame. He'd known Morgana Fontaine for years. The first day of second grade, another boy had pulled on her raven black hair braid, and Jamie shoved him away. Morgan, needing no one to fight her battles for her, turned and punched the boy in the nose. Sitting next to each other in the school office, waiting to see the principal, they quietly joked about the open-mouthed gaping look on the boy on his face as he sat on the ground trying to contemplate what had just happened. They'd been friends ever since. For the last year or so, Jamie had felt his feelings toward her changing towards something deeper than friendship. Her sister, Claire, was about the same age as Lester. Jamie knew the girl, certainly. He often walked the sisters home after school with Lester dragging his feet behind him. But Jamie was really only there to spend time with Morgan. The emotions he felt about it weren't well-defined as of yet, but something in his stomach had heaved in the brief moment he had thought she was missing. His relief was that she wasn't offset by the knowledge that she would surely be devastated by Claire's disappearance. Neither girl had been in school the last two days, and this explained why. Mom, may I be excused, please? She hadn't finished her nod before Jamie was halfway out the door. The Fontaine's house was only a few streets down, and he could be there in minutes. He'd meant to go see Morgan before now, but the thought of the dark looks her mother always gave him whenever he walked the girls home had warded him off from showing up uninvited. Back before dark, boy, his father yelled after him, 
or you'll be the next one on the side of a milk carton. He'd gone three blocks when he heard a high-pitched voice calling his name behind him. Jamie, Jamie, wait for me. He turned and saw Lester running as fast as his legs would carry him. Jamie stopped and waited for him to catch up. He arrived, panting, hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. Jamie frowned. What do you think you're doing, Sprout? Mom said I could go with you. Claire's my friend, too. Yeah, well, maybe I don't feel like having you tag along. Mom said I had to stick with you and that if you didn't want me to come, you had to walk me back home. Jamie ground his teeth. Fine. But you stay right with me and do what I say, got it? Lester nodded seriously. All right. First things first, keep your mouth shut. But I... What did I just say? Mouth shut or I'll walk you home. It won't take that long to drop you off. Lester grudgingly nodded again, his excitement at being allowed to come somewhat tempered. Good. Let's go. They continued down the street and made the turn onto Blackwood Drive, reaching the Fontaines a few minutes later. Walking up the steps with Lester close on his heels, Jamie knocked firmly on the door. Half turning towards the road as he waited, Jamie's eyes fell on the dilapidated building a little farther down the street, as they often did when he walked Morgan home. It must have been really something back in its day, what with its massive stone walls and windows, enormous garden and high iron fence. But the wicker house had been abandoned for more than forty years. The walls were dirty and the windows broken, the garden so overgrown that more closely resembled a jungle, and the fence was mottled with rust. The wicked spikes jutting out on the top of the posts still looked plenty sharp, though. Jamie felt an involuntary shiver crawl down his spine. People said the place was haunted, and it was easy to see why, even in the daylight. Quick steps approached from inside the house, and Jamie turned back just as the door swung open. Mrs. Fontaine stood there, a tissue held in one hand, and her eyes tinged with red. It was obvious she had been crying. Good evening, Mrs. Fontaine. We, we heard about Claire. We were hoping we could see Morgana. Jamie was always careful to use Morgan's full name around her mother. Morgan hated it, but her mother was especially particular in that regard. We're terribly sorry about what's happened. Lester nodded solemnly next to him, so far continuing to obey the order to keep his mouth shut. For a moment, Jamie was afraid the woman would slam the door in their faces and send them packing, but then she bent over and swept both of them up in a hug. Of course, boys, of course, boys. Come in. It's a trying time, and Morgana needs her friends to help her through this. She's upstairs. Thank you, ma'am. Lester followed closely as Jamie went up the stairs and down the hallway to Morgan's room. He knocked lightly and waited a moment. All was quiet. He knocked again and called softly through the door. Morgan, it's Jamie. I've got Lester with me. We came to see you. There was a moment of silence before she answered. Go away, Jamie. Her response from within was muffled through the door. I, I don't want to see anyone. Oh, come on, don't be like that. Even your mom said we should come up. And you know how she usually feels about me even standing out on your porch. Please, Morgan. Lester piped up from beside him. We heard about Claire. My daddy told us she's missing. We just want to make sure you're okay. Jamie glared down at his brother and briefly considered tweaking him on the side of the ear before he heard movement on the other side of the door. After a brief scrambling at the handle, it creaked open a few inches and Morgan peered through the crack. The interior of the room was dark, and Morgan squinted into the light of the hallway. Jamie's heart lurched into his throat. She looked awful. Unlike her mother, Morgan's eyes weren't red from crying but were bloodshot just the same. Deep circles under her eyes suggested she hadn't slept for the last several days, and her raven-black hair was snarled into a tangled bird's nest on top of her head. She looked thinner than normal, as if she hadn't been eating. Getting her bearings, she eyed Lester with an appraising look. Missing, huh, twerp? That's what they're saying? That's what you think is going on? <laughs> her laugh had a slight manic tone to it. It continued for several moments too long. Jamie and Lester exchanged a concerned glance before she finally regained control of herself. Hey, 
Sorry about that. I haven't slept in a few days. You better come in before Mom changes her mind. She opened the door wider and made a sweeping gesture with her arms. Jimmy walked through the door with Lester following, gripping his hand tightly. The room was a mess. It was hard to see details in the dark, but Jamie could smell the dirty clothes heaped about the room and noticed piles of used dishes stacked here and there throughout. The only light came from a tiny lamp sitting on a desk at the far wall, the rest of which were strewn with old newspapers. A small, leather-bound book that looked like a diary or journal lay open in the middle of the desk. Morgan retrieved the book before moving to the bed where she sat, pulling her legs up and crossing them in front of her. Jamie looked around for a place to sit before finally settling for a relatively open spot on the floor, Lester crouching down beside him. Morgan stared at the two boys, unblinking, like a bird of prey on its perch, deciding what to do with a morsel it had just spied in the field below. Jamie tried to think of something to say, but his mind uh, was strangely blank. Instead, he cleared his throat in the uncomfortable silence. Finally, Morgan apparently made up her mind. What do you know about Thomas Wicker? she asked. What, you, you mean the millionaire, the one whose old house is down the block? That's the one, yeah. What do you know about him? Jamie was confused by the line of questioning. Well, uh, I mean, like I said, he, he was a millionaire. I think he had some oil fields or something, and he was uh, some kind of explorer. Had all kinds of weird stuff he did in Africa and all over the place. He built that house about 40 years ago, and he had a wife, but she disappeared a few years after that. And, uh, he trailed off. Yes, her face remained blank, but conveyed an air of expectation. He killed himself, Lester whispered softly. He killed his maid and the gardener, and then he jumped out of the attic window. Jamie glared at Lester. How do you know about that, squirt? Lester stared at the ground. Timmy Boyle told the story at school, but everybody knows, Jamie. Morgan's lips curved slightly up into a smile. There was no warmth in her. That's right. Everybody knows, and everybody's wrong. She chuckled, slightly patting the book on her lap. This book? It has the truth. And let me tell you, boys, in this case, the truth is a whole hell of a lot stranger than fiction. Jamie eyed the book skeptically. Uh, oh, yeah? What is that thing, anyway? This whole thing? Morgan's tone was playful, but her eyes, deadly serious. Why, nothing less than a journal of Thomas Wicker. It took Jamie a half hour to page through the journal. He didn't read it in depth other than a few passages Morgan had specifically marked, Lester trying to lean over his shoulder the whole time. Finally, he reached the end. Where did you find this thing? What do you think? In that fucking house buried under piles of papers up in the attic. You went in there? Morgan, you must be crazier than he was. There's no way the stuff in this book is true. Wicker must have been insane. I mean, he was insane, remember? He killed those people who worked for him, then he killed himself. The stuff he wrote in here is the rambling of a lunatic. Morgan scowled at him. Yeah? How stupid do you think I am? Seriously? That I'm just going to believe something that's written in an old book? Jamie frowned. What are you talking about? You mean you've got more? She rolled her eyes and got up from the bed, moving toward the desk. Loads more. The police report from the night Wicker killed himself. News articles about his so-called wife before she mysteriously vanished. And stories. Tons and tons of stories. From people claiming to have seen her after she disappeared. But that's nothing. Just ghost stories to frighten kids. He stopped as he saw her eyes threaten to overflow with tears. Angrily, she wiped them away. That's what I thought, too, at first, but then... Her voice broke in a sob. Whispering, she spoke almost to herself, her gaze fixed straight ahead, eyes staring at nothing. It was just a dare. It was just a stupid dare. 
Jeremy felt like he'd been hit in the gut, his breath short like the time his father had cracked his ribs. Morgan, what did you do? She turned to look at him. The tears had come back, and this time they ran down her face. Oh, God, Jamie, I think I killed my sister. Jamie felt the world start to spin. Morgan took a couple of moments to compose herself, then she began. We'd grown up listening to the stories, you know, everyone had. You'd think that maybe living down the street from the house, you'd eventually get used to it, but I never did. I could never look at it without getting creeped out. I hate being scared, and finally a couple of weeks ago, I decided I'd do something about it. The breath itched in her throat before she went on. I didn't tell you or anyone else at school because I was afraid you'd make fun of me. This just sort of became my pet project. I started at the library, went through all the old records they had to find out everything I could about the house. There's a lot, more than a lot. Wicker was basically the closest thing this town had to a celebrity back in the day. So the newspapers carried the story for weeks after he died, hid it from every angle. The one thing they had absolutely no information on was his wife. She moved over to the desk and picked up one of the old newspapers. The only hard evidence I could find to show that she was even for sure existed was this article here. She passed the paper to Jamie. The top article on the page was devoted to Lady Wicker, recounting stories and speculations that various people around town had made about her. It was accompanied by a picture of the second story of the house in much better condition than it currently stood, and Jamie could see the fuzzy image of a woman standing in the window, the only detail a surprising sharpness of her eyes. Finally, I got all I could out of the newspapers. For the amount of stories they ran after Wicker's death, they had surprisingly little actual information about him. So last week, I decided I'd go inside and see if I could find anything. I figured maybe once I saw what was in there, I'd be less scared. Claire insisted on going with me. You know how little siblings are. She looked pointedly at Lester before continuing. I really hadn't thought we'd find anything, but once we snuck in, it looked like the house hadn't been touched in all this time. Once the police completed the investigation, they just sort of closed the front door and walked away. There's so many creepy stories about the place. I think it's kept a lot of people out who would have gone through it before now. I wish I would have done the same. She sighed. There's still a whole bunch of weird stuff in there. Masks and statues and all sorts of things. The room the picture in the paper shows as Mrs. Wicker as these symbols scrawled all over the walls. Eventually, we made our way up to the attic. The house is all run down, and some of the stairs were pretty rotten, but the ladder leading up to the attic was still there. I thought if I saw where he killed himself, that would be enough to cure me of my fear, so we went up and poked around. That's where I found this. She tapped the journal. It was getting late, so we went back home. That's when I first started going through the book. I thought the same thing you did, that Wicker must have been nuts. But the worst part was that my fear hadn't gone away. Just the opposite. All the stuff in the book made me even more afraid, even though a part of me was telling myself it had to be make-believe. The next day, I was talking to Claire about it. She laughed at me and said I was scared of a stupid, empty house. I told her if she wasn't a scaredy cat, she should spend an hour in Mrs. Wicker's old room at midnight. I think she was afraid, but she didn't want to admit it in front of me. You know how little siblings are. She looked at Lester again. So last Saturday we snuck out again. That's the first day the fog really came in. We were practically on top of the house before I could see it. I offered to let Claire out of the deal, but she was insistent, even though she was so scared she was shaking. I told her that at least I'd lower the terms of the dare. I didn't want to be there any more than she did. All she had to do was go upstairs to the room, wave to me through the window, then we could go home. I had to go in through the gate just to be able to see the window. Claire went up the steps and only looked back once before squeezing through the front door. I don't know how long I waited, standing there, staring at the window, waiting for her to come. 
It was probably only a minute or two, but it felt like hours. Finally, I saw this figure at the window. It was hard to make it out through the fog, but it was definitely person-shaped. I thought it had to be clear. I mean, what else could it be? It was there for a moment, and I could tell it was looking at me, but then it moved away from the window. I think I must have been holding my breath, because I remember I let it out then, thinking that Claire would be back down in just a minute, and we could leave. I'd kid her a little about not having the guts to wave to me, but in reality I was glad she was moving as quickly as she was. Those were the thoughts going through my head when I heard Claire calling me. I looked up and there she was, standing in the window, waving at me clear as day, even through the fog. She had this huge smile on her face, so proud of what she'd done. Morgan choked back a sob. She was just trying to impress me, the little idiot. But I couldn't be happy for her because I knew she looked up at Jamie. I knew she wasn't alone in the house. I yelled at her to get down from there to run. First she looked mad that I wasn't giving her the praise she had expected. Then she looked scared. She had this terrified look on her little face when she finally backed away from the window. That was the last time I saw her alive. God, I waited there, calling to her forever. I was scared that I was so loud I'd wake my parents down the street, but part of me hoped that would happen, that they'd come. I should have gone in there after her, but I was so scared. Her eyes were tearing up again. My little sister was in trouble, and I was too big of a coward to do anything about it. Jamie, I must have stood there for twenty minutes, just yelling her name. I never even heard anything from her, not a scream, not a sound. Maybe if I'd heard something, knew for sure that something was happening that would have spurred me to run in, but I didn't. I couldn't. Finally, my voice started to go hoarse, and I just sat down on the ground and started to cry. I'm not sure how long I was sitting there sobbing before I noticed that the fog had started to thicken even more. Suddenly, I became aware of this presence. You know how sometimes you can tell someone is looking at you even when you aren't looking at them? It was like that. I looked up and couldn't make anything out five feet in front of me because of the fog. But even so, I could see this pair of eyes staring at me from near the front door, she shuddered. I don't know how I know this, but those eyes were happy, Jamie. Happy and hungry. I thought I'd been scared before that. I thought I'd been out of screams. Or was I wrong? I turned and ran so fast it's a wonder I didn't knock myself out trying to get through the gate. Even more wonder that I managed to find my way back to my house through the fog. But I did, screaming and crying and blubbering the whole way. By that point, I actually had managed to wake my parents up with all the noise I was making. They were at the front door when I just about collapsed on the welcome mat. It took them a while to get me calmed down enough to tell them what happened. My dad grabbed a flashlight and headed over to the house. He searched until morning, but he didn't find anything. No trace of Claire or of what or who took her. Then he called the police. She sighed. They've had me tell them my story over and over again, hoping I could give them some clue about who took Claire, some detail. Even if I could have seen more clearly through the fog, I don't think it would have helped. Did you know there's a lot of missing kids in the wake? It's been going on for a while now, Jamie. A bit even longer than they think or would admit. I bet it's been going on since the night Thomas Wicker threw himself out of his attic window. Since the night she got out. She opened the book on her lap and absently started to leaf through the pages. It's all in here, the stuff Wicker saw that he encountered. She was one of them, that thing everyone thought was his wife. He kept her locked away up there in that room so that she'd never be free, but she got free, and Wicker decided he'd rather kill himself than face what he knew she'd do once she was. She paused, blankly staring at the book. Now hang on a second, Morgan, Jamie cut in. Nothing you saw proves anything that's in the book is true. I mean, I certainly believe that you saw someone in the house, and in all likelihood, they're the one that took Claire. 
but there's nothing about it in other than those eyes that suggest there are ghosts or demons or whatever that are responsible for this. And that could have just been your mind playing tricks on you. It's probably just some homeless guy. They haven't found a body. Claire could still be out there. Morgan looked up, a small, sad smile on her face. Oh, Jamie, don't you get it? They won't find a body. Jamie felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand at attention. What do you mean, Morgan? How can you be so sure? Because remember how I said when she moved away from the window that was the last time I saw her alive? I didn't say that was the last time I saw her. It's why I haven't been able to sleep. Morgan shivered slightly, took a breath. Claire comes to me every night out of the fog. She looks at me through my window with her black, empty eyes, her hand lightly tapping on the pane like she wants to come inside. But somehow I know that's not it at all. It's not that she wants to be let in. It's that she wants me to come out. But more can Lester whispered, wide-eyed. Your room is on the second floor. She threw her head back and laughed. I know, it's wild, isn't it? Her eyes narrowed as she looked at Jamie with an accusing expression. So any more bright ideas or thoughts about how crazy I am? Jamie shook his head. Have you told the parents? The police? Morgan chuckled at that. <laughs> told them exactly what? That some demon succubus stole my little sister and turned her into a monster? Come on, Jamie. You know they'd never even believe that, even with the journal to back up my story. You could have them stay with you, show her to them. I already tried it. She doesn't come when other people are around, just makes the adults give each other concerned glances when they think I'm not looking. No, I'm going to have to do this myself. Jamie's voice was almost a whisper. Do exactly what? Morgan's mouth drew into a tight, hard smile. Why well, put the bitch back in her cage, of course? Jamie only hesitated a moment before he nodded. Okay, what can I do to help? Jamie silently made his way down the empty streets toward Morgan's house. It hadn't been any trouble to sneak out. His dad was drunk as always, passed out in front of the TV. Nights like that, Mom went to bed early to avoid the possibility of waking him up and putting him in one of his black moods. It was too easy to walk out the front door with only the slightest creak of hinges to betray his exit. Lester hadn't wanted him to go, of course. The kid was terrified. But then, when he realized he wasn't going to convince Jamie to stay back, he tried to insist on coming himself. That wasn't going to happen. Morgan had already lost Claire screwing around with his house, and whether he was about to encounter demon women or other some deranged pedophile, there was no way Jamie would let the little squirt tag along. Not this time. Morgan had laid out the bones of the plan earlier that day. The journal never referenced the thing called Lady Wicker by name, but there were plenty of passages talking about her and she. Morgan also had found a detailed drawing that resembled the symbols on the walls of what had been Lady Wicker's prison. Some of the symbols were marred, Jamie, she said, opening book to the page in question. Strange letters that looked nothing so much as random scratches and scribbles covered the paper. I'm sure that's what let her get out of there. It can't be she's completely free, though, or she wouldn't still be hanging around the wake. My guess is that whatever did it just caused the cage door to open wide enough so she could stick her head out and snap at anything that gets too close. If we can fix the symbols, it'll close the door again. It seemed like a good plan, as far as Jamie could tell, except he would have preferred they go during the daylight. You think I don't want that, too? Morgan looked at him incredulously. Christ, Jamie, going back into that fucking house is the absolute last thing I want to do, especially at night. 
But there's no way my parents will let me go over there after everything that happened. And they kept a close eye enough on me during the day that there's no way I'd be able to sneak out. We have to go at night. And so he reluctantly agreed. Jamie arrived at Morgan's house and crouched down on her front porch. The fog was already starting to heavily roll in, but he could still make out the ominous outline of the wicker house further down the road. A slight noise made him turn as Morgan slipped out of the front door to join him. Good, you're here. I didn't want to have to wait for you out here alone. No telling if my sister will decide to show up, and I really don't want to find out what happens if she does. Did you bring the paint and brushes? Jamie patted the backpack slung over his shoulder. Yeah, do you have the journal? Morgan held it up along with the battery-powered flashlight. To help us see, uh, so we can draw the symbols. Let's go, I want to get this over with. In silence, the pair stepped into the fog. The heavy iron gate screamed loudly as Morgan pushed it open far enough for them to squeeze through. Looking up, Jamie realized this was the closest he'd ever been to the wicker house. The structure squatted like an insect, the gaze of its painless windows radiating malevolence as tendrils of fog curled and wrapped around its eaves. Its empty gaze seemed to follow them as they made their way up the overgrown path and slipped through the front door. Once inside, Morgan switched on the flashlight, the white beam slicing through the otherwise pitch-black darkness. She played the light around a bit to orient herself in the gloom, and Jamie could see that what she'd said about the house was true. The place looked as if it hadn't been touched in forty years, that it stood empty. Finding the staircase with the light, Morgan slowly moved up to the second floor, Jamie following closely on her heels, carefully avoiding the rotted steps. The top of the stairwell opened to a long hallway. The door at the far end cracked slightly open. Morgan fixed her light on the opening. That's the one, she whispered in Jamie's ear. Come on. He shivered, but he didn't know if it was from fear or from her closeness, the tingle of her breath on his skin. Silently, they crept down the hall and soon found themselves in the room. Morgan passed the beam along the walls, and Jamie's mouth dropped open. The symbols were something to be seen in the journal, certainly, but they were a completely different matter in real life. The number of them was astounding, and it was obvious that they'd been painted on the walls with meaning and purpose, far from the jumble of scribbles he thought when he first saw them in the book. It seemed as if they glowed with a faint luminescence, and not for the first time Jamie wondered if conducting the repairs would be as easy as Morgan had made it out to be. Finally, Morgan rested the light on the far wall, and Jamie could see exactly what she had meant. Several of the symbols were noticeably smudged, though it was impossible to tell what might have caused the damage. Jamie dropped his pack to the floor and hurriedly removed the two brushes and small can of paint he had stuffed inside. Here, hold this so I can see. Morgan handed him the flashlight as she opened the journal to the page she had marked. Picking up the paint and a brush, she moved over to the damaged section. Okay, shine it over here. He complied, and with a look of intense concentration, Morgan began to carefully paint. She'd been... At work for several minutes, it was making good headway when the fog began noticeably seeping through the broken window. A feeling that he was being watched began to grow stronger, and Jamie felt a rash of goosebumps break out down his arms. He glanced from side to side, attempting to find the cause of the feeling. Morgan, I know, she snapped, her voice trembling slightly. I feel it too. She's coming. Just keep the beam steady. Finishing this is our only chance. She continued to work, and Jamie saw her brush shake slightly, small droplets of paint falling to the floor. A sudden cloud of fog boiled in through the window, and as he turned, he found himself facing the opposite corner of the room. From its depths peered a shocking, intense pair of eyes. They fixed on him. The gaze immediately locked his own, and in a moment, Jamie felt his will drain away. The flashlight fell heavily to the floor at his feet. Jamie was floating in grayness, his mind as blank as the faceless fog surrounding him. He couldn't remember where he was or what he had been doing, but some part of him thought it might have been important. Jamie, 
At the edge of his consciousness, he could barely make out a voice calling his name. What would they possibly want? His mind, content to remain in limbo, rejected the summons. Jamie! This time, his name was accompanied by a sharp pain, jolting him out of the hazy dreams he'd been wallowing in. In an instant, he was back to himself. Lester stood in front of him, tears streaming down from his eyes, a line of snot running down his nose as he sobbed, his hand held back for another slap. Jamie caught the boy's hand as it flew forward. Whoa! Easy, bud! I'm here. I'm... His gaze fell on Morgan. The flashlight had fallen so that the beam bled over where she was lying on the ground, twitching violently. Her eyes rolled back in her head so only the whites were visible. He grabbed the light and rushed to her side, trying to hold her hand steady. Morgan! Morgan! Come on, wake up! Jamie! Lester was tugging at his shoulder. Damn it, Lester, what? His eyes moved up and his voice failed him. The fog continued to fill the room, but even through the thick screen of white, he could see the ring of children around them. They stood shoulder to shoulder, their expressions blank, their eyes black. Twisting with Lester, clutching his arm, he shone the beam around the room to see they were completely surrounded. When the light reached the front of the room, it fell upon a figure lost in the fog, save for the same intense pair of eyes that had almost completely bewitched him before. As the boys watched, the lines of the figure seemed to coalesce and solidify until finally a woman appeared before them, as if by magic. Dressed all in white, she was beautiful, her hair a black, even darker than Morgan's, her skin as pale as new-fallen snow. Her lips were blood-red and drawn up in a cruel, knowing smile. Her eyes were the same as before, twin stars that had seemed to draw Jamie into them with a supernatural attraction. Their message, one of unspeakable pleasure and pain. Jamie shuddered. At his side, Lester was crying, the words falling out of him. Jamie, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I had to come, I just had to. And then you wouldn't wake up, and the kids were standing around us, and... Lester, shut up, Jamie snapped. Remember what I said earlier? If you tag along, you have to keep your mouth shut. The boy quieted as Jamie slowly eased his left arm, holding the flashlight under Morgan's back. The girl had stopped convulsing, but her eyes were closed and her breath was quick and shallow. Now, Jamie reached for the pack and slipped his other hand inside. When I tell you to run, I want you to run downstairs, out the door, and back home as fast as you can go. Got it? He gripped the small bottle concealed inside the pack. Ready? Run! In one motion... Jamie flipped the cap of the bottle and whipped his hand out of the pack in a semicircle, spraying liquid all around him. He had taken the bottle of holy water from his mother's nightstand, but since his comic book said it sometimes worked for ghosts, he added a couple tablespoons of salt to the mix. Whether it was the saline or the blessed water, something made the woman and her hideous charges draw back, hissing, arms raised protectively. Jerking to his feet, Jamie awkwardly picked Morgan up in his arms, and stumbled through the door, running down the hallway as fast as he could, Lester dogging his heels. He had just reached the bottom of the stairs, the entryway beckoning open wide before them, when he heard a crash and scream. Turning back, he shone the flashlight on his brother. In his hurry, Lester had stepped on one of the rotted stairs, his foot punching straight through the worm-eaten wood. Worse, Jamie could see where a jagged broken piece of stair had punctured his thigh, the blood leaking out bright red in the beam of the light. With a cry, Jamie lay Morgan at the bottom of the steps and rushed to help his brother. The leg was wedged tight, and anything he did to manipulate it caused Lester to moan in agony. Crying, Jamie started striking at the edges of the stair, trying to work Lester's leg free, while the boy whimpered and sobbed. An unnatural silence caused Jamie to stop his struggle and raise his eyes to the top of the staircase. The woman stood surrounded by her children, the fog twisting around her feet, giving her the impression of floating. The message in her eyes was a promise of pain, retribution for the injury caused by the water. From where he was trapped, Lester could see everything. Go, he cried, struggling to talk through the pain. Get her out of here. Lester, I can't leave you. The little boy smiled weakly. I came to help make sure you got out, Jamie. You have to get out. Damn it! 
Tears were running down Jamie's face. I'm coming back, you hear me? I'm getting her out, then I'm coming back. He stumbled back down to Morgan. We're all getting out. Gripping her under her arms, Jamie started dragging her backwards out the front door. As he passed through the entryway, he glanced up and saw the woman had begun to descend the stairs towards her brother, flanked by her hideous children. Jamie redoubled his efforts, practically falling down the steps through the billowing fog. In only a few moments, he was through the gate, intending her to leave her there, when Morgan's eyes snapped open and she pulled herself from his gasp with a shout. Jesus, Jamie, we have to get out of here. I was so wrong, so wrong. God, she was in my mind. She wants to use me, she clutched Jamie's sleeve. We need to get as far from here as we can. Jamie shook his head. I can't leave. Lester's in there. He's the only reason we got this far. I have to go back for him. Tears began to roll down Morgan's cheek. Jamie, you don't understand. I can't go back in there. If she uses me the way she wants, it'll mean terrible, terrible things for all of us, for the world. Jamie smiled sadly. I know, and I'm not asking you to, but he's my brother. He stooped down and kissed her lightly on the forehead. I love you, Morgan. I just want to make sure you knew that. No, 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 Jamie, please don't go, please. He stood, and Morgan tried to clutch his arm, but he gently pulled away. I'm sorry, he said. Goodbye. With that, he turned and walked away, his shape gradually dimming in the white cloud until he was gone. Morgan collapsed on the sidewalk, her sobs the only sound breaking the silence. The wicker house watched, content in her misery, until it too was swallowed by the fog. Frank Lawrence was drunk, as he often was, more so now than he had ever been before. Since he had been fired from the factory, he only had time, and as far as he was concerned, there was no way better to spend the time than drink, especially lately. He took a swig from the forty wrapped in a brown paper bag he held in his hand. Mary was gone. She'd left shortly after Jamie and Lester had disappeared, he suppose. He'd take it. She'd accuse him of all sorts of things, even suggesting he had a hand in their disappearance. Frank took it all, privately resenting the injustice, but knowing on some level that he deserved all that and more. Maybe he wasn't guilty of everything. She tried to stick on him, but God knew he had plenty of sins. He never said any differently. Still, he knew he hadn't had anything to do with the boys missing. Christ, didn't she know he loved them? It was the drink that made him lash out and the stress he was under to provide for a family that made him drink. Hadn't he cut back after that time he heard Jamie? It was too much to ask to give it up completely. No pleasing her. And hadn't he treated her well? Kept a roof over their heads? Food on the table? Sure, he may have taken a swing at her every now and again. But lots of husbands did. Nobody's perfect. And he never hit the boys. Not after that time. He wandered down Blackwood Drive and found himself standing in front of the broken-down house near where they had found the Fontaine girl. She'd been out of her mind, shaking and screaming and crying. When they finally got her to calm down, she'd been talking crazy. Women in white, ghost children, absolute lunacy. And somehow his boys were mixed up in the middle of it. They searched the house, looking for them, and found Jamie's backpack in one of the rooms upstairs. Morgan insisted there had been some old journal she had with her, but there was no sign of that. Probably just another figment of her imagination. The symbols in the room were sure odd, but for the life of him, Frank couldn't figure out what would make the girl try to cover them up. It was obvious there was a decent-sized portion of the wall that had been recently painted over, the paint and brushes still wet where they lay. The place gave him the creeps. He took another slug of booze. Fuck you place. Probably should be burnt to the ground. His boys missing, the girl's sisters missing. And now he heard the Fontaines had packed the girl off to some loony bin somewhere. Couldn't get her to tell a straight story, out of her goddamn mind. Hell, for all Frank knew, she had something to do with Jamie and disappearing. Eh, no probably about it. Someone should definitely burn the place. Before he even had time to really think about the thought, Frank was halfway up the path to the front door. He had a lighter in his pocket. A house this old with that much dry wood? 
That was plenty to make it go up like a matchbook. He stopped at the foot of the stairs, fumbling for his lighter, not noticing the vicious fog that had begun creeping about him. By the time he looked up, lighter in hand, the world was completely white. If he hadn't known it, he wouldn't have been able to tell the house stood in front of him. He took a step forward and banged his shin, falling on the steps. He struggled to get up, but his balance was off, a victim of the booze. Finally, he regained his feet when he heard a voice. Hello, Father. Frank drunkenly swayed where he stood. Was he imagining things? But no, there was Jamie in front of him, paler than usual and his eyes strangely black, but there was no mistaking his boy. Jamie, is it really you? He felt tears brimming in his eyes. I missed you, boy, you and your brother. His pale son smiled slightly. I'm sure you have. But don't worry, we're here now, and our mother is with us. Jamie moved forward, and to Frank's surprise, he saw Lester step beside him. And was that the other Fontaine girl next to them? It had to be. Frank dropped to his knees. Missed you, boys. Missed you so much. He opened his arms, and they moved into his embrace, their arms tightly encircling his neck. Missed you. The words trailed off as Frank saw a beautiful woman appear in the fog, her otherworldly eyes alight with joy and hunger. The cloud continued to thicken, until all that was visible were a few shadows that seemed to struggle briefly before falling still. There was no sound, as sighs and screams alike were drowned, lost in the fog, covered in a blanket of white. Arthur's Wake continue to die. The Toll House by W. W. Jacobs Performed by Otis Chire It's all nonsense, said Jack Barnes. Of course, people have died in a house. People die in every house. As for the noises, wind in the chimney, rats in the wainscot, are very convincing to a nervous man. Give me another cup of tea, Meagle. Lester and White are first, said Meagle, who was presiding at the tea table, at the Three Feathers Inn. You've had two. Lester and White finished their cups with irritating slowness, pausing between sips to sniff the aroma and to discover the sex and dates of arrival of the strangers, which floated in some numbers in the beverage. Mr. Meagle served them to the brim, and then, turning to the grimly expectant Mr. Barnes, blandly requested him to ring for hot water. "'We'll try and keep your nerves in the present healthy condition,' he remarked. "'For my part, I have a sort of half-and-half -half belief in the supernatural.' All sensible people have, said Lester. An aunt of mine saw a ghost once. White nodded. I had an uncle that saw one, he said. It's always somebody else that sees them, says Barnes. Well, there is a house, said Meagle. A large house at an absurdly low rent, and nobody will take it. It has taken toll of at least one life of every family that has lived there, however short the time. And since it has stood empty, caretaker after caretaker has died there. The last caretaker died fifteen years ago. Exactly, said Barnes. Long enough ago for legends to accumulate. I'll bet you a sovereign you won't spend the night there alone for all you talk, said White, suddenly. And I, said Lester. No, said Barnes, slowly. I don't believe in ghosts, nor in any supernatural things, whatever. All the same, I admit that I should not care to pass a night there alone. But why not? inquired White. Wind in the chimney, said Meagle with a grin. Rats in the wainscot, chimed in Lester. As you like, said Barnes, coloring. Suppose we all go, said Meagle. Start after supper and get there about eleven. We've been walking for ten days now without an adventure, except Barnes's discovery that ditch water smells longest. 
It'll be a novelty at any rate, and if we break the spell by all surviving, the grateful owner ought to come down handsome. Let's see what the landlord has to say about it first, said Lester. There is no fun in passing a night in an ordinary empty house. Let us make sure that it is haunted. He rang the bell and, sending for the landlord, appealed to him in the name of our common humanity not to let them waste a night watching in a house in which specters and hobgoblins had no part. The reply was more than reassuring, and the landlord, after describing with considerable art the exact appearance of a head which had been seen hanging out of a window in the moonlight, wound up with polite but urgent request that they would settle his bill before they went. "'It's all very well for you young gentlemen to have your fun,' he said indulgently. "'But supposing as how you are all found dead in the morning, what about me?' It ain't called the Toll House for nothing, you know. Who died there last? inquired Barnes, with an air of polite derision. A tramp, was the reply. He went there for the sake of half a crown, and they found him next morning hanging from the balusters dead. Suicide, said Barnes, and sound mine. The landlord nodded. That's what the jury brought it in. He said slowly, but his mind was sound enough when he went in there. I'd known him, off and on, for years. I'm a poor man, but I wouldn't spend the night in that house for a hundred pounds. He repeated his remark as they started on their expedition a few hours later. They left as the inn was closing for the night, bolts shot noisily behind them, and as the regular customers trudged slowly homewards, they set off at a brisk pace in the direction of the house. Most of the cottages were already in darkness, and lights and others went out as they passed. It seems rather hard that we have got to lose a night's rest in order to convince Barnes of the existence of ghosts, said White. It's in a good cause, said Meagle, a most worthy object, and sometimes seems to tell me that we shall succeed. You didn't forget the candles, Lester? I have brought two, was the reply. All the old man could spare. There was but little moon, and the night was cloudy. The road between high hedges was dark, and in one place, where it ran through a wood, so black that they twice stumbled in the uneven ground at the side of it. Fancy leaving our comfortable beds for this, said White again. Let me see. This desirable residential sepulchre lies to the right, doesn't it? Farther on, said Meagle. They walked on for some time in silence, broken only by White's tribute to the softness, the cleanliness, and the comfort of the bed which was receding further and further into the distance. Under Meagle's guidance they turned off at last to the right, and, after a walk of a quarter mile, saw the gates of the house before them. The lodge was almost hidden by overgrown shrubs, and the drive was choked with rank growths. Meagle leading, they pushed through it until the dark pile of the house loomed above them. There is a window at the back where we can get in, so the landlord says, said Lester as they stood before the hall door. Window? said Meagle. Nonsense. Let's do the thing properly. Where's the knocker? He felt forward in the darkness and gave a thundering rat-tat-tat at the door. "'Don't play the fool,' said Barnes crossly. "'Ghostly servants are all asleep,' said Mago gravely. "'But I'll wake them up before I've done with them. "'It's scandalous, keeping us out here in the dark.' He plied the knocker again, and the noise volleyed in the emptiness beyond. Then, with a sudden explanation, he put out his hands and stumbled forward. Why, it was open all the time, he said, with an odd catch in his voice. Come on. I don't believe it was open, said Lester, hanging back. Somebody is playing us a trick. Nonsense, said Meagle sharply. Give me a candle. Thanks. Who's got a match? 
Barnes produced a box and struck one, and Meagle, shielding the candle with his hand, led the way forward to the foot of the stairs. "'Shut the door, somebody,' he said. "'It's too much draft.' "'It is shut,' said White, glancing behind him. Meagle fingered his chin. "'Who shut it?' he inquired, looking from one to the other. "'Who came in last?' "'I did,' said Lester. "'But I don't remember shutting it. "'Perhaps I did, though.' "'Meagle, about to speak, thought better of it, "'and, still carefully guarding the flame, "'began to explore the house with the others close behind. "'Shadows danced on the wall and lurked in the corners as they proceeded. "'At the end of the passage they found a second staircase, "'and descending it slowly gained the first floor.' Careful, said Meagle, as they gained the landing. He held the candle forward and showed where the balusters had broken away. Then he peered curiously into the void beneath. This is where the tramp hanged himself, I suppose, he said thoughtfully. You've got an unwholesome mind, said White as they walked on. This place is quite creepy enough without your remembering that. Now let's find a comfortable room and have a little nip of whiskey apiece and a pipe. How will this do? He opened a door at the end of the passage and revealed a small square room. Meagle led the way with a candle, and first melting a drop or two of tallow, stuck it on the mantelpiece. The others seated themselves on the floor and watched pleasantly as White drew from his pocket a small bottle of whiskey and a tin cup. Hmm. "'I've forgotten the water,' he exclaimed. "'I'll soon get some,' said Meagle. "'He tugged violently at the bell handle, "'and the rusty jangling of a bell sounded from a distant kitchen. "'He rang again. "'Don't play the fool,' said Barnes roughly. "'Meagle laughed. "'I only wanted to convince you,' he said kindly. "'There ought to be, at any rate, one ghost in the servants' hall.' "'Barnes held up his hand for silence.' "'Yes?' said Meagle, with a grin at the other two. "'Is anybody coming?' "'Suppose we drop this game and go back,' said Barnes suddenly. "'I don't believe in spirits, but nerves are outside anybody's command. "'You may laugh as you like, but it really seemed to me "'that I heard a door open below and steps on the stairs.' "'His voice was drowned in a roar of laughter. "'He's coming around,' said Meagle with a smirk. "'By the time I have done with him.' He will be a confirmed believer. Well, who will go and get some water? Will you, Barnes? No, was the reply. If there is any, it might not be safe to drink after all these years, said Lester. We must do without it. Meagle nodded, and taking a seat on the floor, held out his hand for the cup. Pipes were lit, and the clean, wholesome smell of tobacco filled the room. White produced a pack of cards. Talk and laughter rang through the room and died away reluctantly in distant corners. "'Empty rooms always delude me into the belief that I possess a deep voice,' said Meagle. "'Tomorrow!' He started up with a smothered explanation as the light went out suddenly, and something struck him on the head. Then the others sprang to their feet. Then Meagle laughed. It's the candle, he exclaimed. I didn't stick it enough. Barnes struck a match and, relighting the candle, stuck it on the mantelpiece, and, sitting down, took up his cards again. What was I going to say, said Meagle. Oh, I know. Tomorrow I... Listen, said White, laying his hand on the other's sleeve. Upon my word, I really thought I heard a laugh. Look here, said Barnes. What do you say to going back? I've had enough of this. I keep fancying that I hear things, too, sounds of something moving about in the passage outside. I know it's only fancy, but it's uncomfortable. You go if you want to, said Meagle, and we will play dummy. Or you might ask the tramp to take your hand for you as you go downstairs. Barnes shivered and exclaimed angrily. He got up and, walking to the half-closed door, listened. "'Go outside,' said Miggle, winking at the other two. "'How dare you to go down to the hall door and back by yourself?' Barnes came back and, bending forward, lit his pipe at the candle. 
I'm nervous, but rational, he said, blowing out a thin cloud of smoke. My nerves tell me that there is something prowling up and down the long passage outside. My reason tells me that it is all nonsense. Where are my cards? He sat down again, and taking up his hand, looked through it carefully and led. Here, play, White, he said after a pause. White made no sign. Why, he is asleep, said Miggle. Wake up, old man, wake up and play. Lester, who was sitting next to him, took the sleeping man by the arm and shook him, gently at first, and then with some roughness. But White, with his back against the wall and his head bowed, made no sign. Mago bawled in his ear and then turned a puzzled face to the others. He sleeps like the dead, he said, grimacing. Well, there are still three of us to keep each other company. Yes, said Lester, nodding. Unless, good Lord, suppose... He broke off and eyed them trembling. Suppose what? inquired Mago. Nothing, stammered Lesser. Let's wake him. Try him again. White? White? It's no good, said Miggle, seriously. There's something wrong about that sleep. That's what I meant, said Lester. And if he goes to sleep like that, why I shouldn't... Miggle sprang to his feet. Nonsense, he said roughly. He's tired out, that's all. Still, let's take him up and clear out. You take his legs, and Barnes will lead the way with the candle. Yes? Who's that? He looked up quickly toward the door. I thought I heard somebody tap, he said, with a shamefaced laugh. Now, Lester, up with him. One, two. Lester? Lester! He sprang forward too late. Lester, with his face buried in his arms, had rolled over on the floor fast asleep, and his utmost efforts failed to waken him. He is asleep, he stammered. Asleep! Barnes, who had taken the candle from the mantelpiece, stood peering at the sleepers in silence and dropping tallow over the floor. We must get out of this, said Miggle. Quick! Barnes hesitated. We can't leave them here, he began. We must, said Miggle in strident tones. If you go to sleep, I shall go. Quick, come! He seized the other man by the arm and strove to drag him to the door. Barnes shook him off and, putting the candle back on the mantelpiece, tried again to rouse the sleepers. It's no good, he said at last, and, turning from them, watched Meagol. Don't you go to sleep, he said anxiously. Meagol shook his head, and they stood for some time in uneasy silence. May as well shut the door, said Barnes at last. He crossed over and closed it gently. Then, at a scuffling noise behind him, he turned and saw Meagle in a heap on the hearthstone. With a sharp catch in his breath, he stood motionless. Inside the room, the candle, fluttering in the draft, showed dimly the grotesque attitudes of the sleepers. Beyond the door there seemed to his overwrought imagination a strange and stealthy unrest. He tried to whistle, but his lips were parched, and in a mechanical fashion he stooped and began to pick up the cards which littered the floor. He stopped once or twice and stood with bent head listening. The unrest outside seemed to increase. A loud creaking sounded from the stairs. "'Who is there?' he cried loudly. The creaking ceased. He crossed to the door and, flinging it open, strode out into the corridor." As he walked, his fears left him suddenly. "'Come on!' he cried with a low laugh. "'All of you! All of you! Show your faces! Your infernal ugly faces! Don't skulk!' He laughed again and walked on, and the heap in the fireplace put out his head, tortoise fashion, and listened in horror to the retreating footsteps. Not until they had become inaudible in the distance did the listeners features relax. "'Good Lord, Lester, we've driven him mad,' he said in a frightened whisper. "'We must go after him.' There was no reply. Meagol sprung to his feet. "'Do you hear?' he cried. "'Stop your fooling now. This is serious. White! Lester! Do you hear?' He bent and surveyed them in angry bewilderment. "'All right,' he said in a trembling voice. "'You won't frighten me now, you know.' 
He turned away and walked with exaggerated carelessness in the direction of the door. He even went outside and peeped through the crack, but the sleepers did not stir. He glanced into the blackness behind, and then came hastily into the room again. He stood for a few seconds regarding them. The stillness in the house was horrible. He could not even hear them breathe. With a sudden resolution, he snatched the candle from the mantelpiece and held the flame to White's finger. Then, as he reeled back, stupefied, the footsteps again became audible. He stood with the candle in his shaking hand, listening. He heard them ascending the farther staircase, but they stopped suddenly as he went to the door. He walked a little way along the passage, and they went scurrying down the stairs, then at a jog trot along the corridor below. He went back to the main staircase, and they ceased again. For a time he hung over the balusters, listening and trying to pierce the blackness below. Then, slowly, step by step, he made his way downstairs, and, holding the candle above his head, peered about him. "'Barnes!' he called. "'Where are you?' Shaking with fright, he made his way along the passage, and, summoning up all of his courage, pushed open doors and gazed fearfully into empty rooms. Then, quite suddenly, he heard the footsteps in front of him. He followed slowly for fear of extinguishing the candle, until they led him at last into a vast, bare kitchen with damp walls and a broken floor. In front of him, a door leading into an inside room had just closed. He ran towards it and flung it open, and a cold air blew out the candle. He stood aghast. "'Barnes!' he cried again. "'Don't be afraid. It is I, Meagle!' There was no answer. He stood, gazing into the darkness, and all the time the idea of something close at hand watching was upon him. Then, suddenly, the steps broke out overhead again. He drew back hastily, and passing through the kitchen groped his way along narrow passages. He could now see better in the darkness, and finding himself at last at the foot of the staircase, began to ascend it noiselessly. He reached the landing just in time to see a figure disappear round the angle of a wall. Still careful to make no noise, he followed the sound of the steps until they led him to the top floor, and he cornered the chase at the end of a short passage. "'Barnes!' he whispered. "'Barnes!' Something stirred in the darkness. A small circular window at the end of the passage just softened the blackness and revealed the dim outlines of a motionless figure. Meagle, in place of advancing, stood almost as still as a sudden horrible doubt took possession of him. With his eyes fixed on the shape in front, he fell back slowly, and as it advanced upon him, burst into a terrible cry. "'Barnes! For God's sakes, is it you?' The echoes of his voice left the air quivering, but the figure before him paid no heed. For a moment he tried to brace his courage up to endure its approach. Then, with a smothered cry, he turned and fled. The passages wound like a maze, and he threaded them blindly in a vain search for the stairs. If he could get down and open the hall door... He caught his breath in a sob, the steps had begun again. At a lumbering trot, they clattered up and down the bare passages, in and out, up and down, as though in search of him. He stood appalled, and then, as they drew near, entered a small room and stood behind the door as they rushed by. He came out and ran swiftly and noiselessly in the other direction, and in a moment the steps were after him. He found the long corridor and raced along it at top speed. The stairs he knew were at the end, and with the steps close behind he descended them in blind haste. The steps gained on him, and he shrank to the side to let them pass, still continuing his headlong flight. Then suddenly he seemed to slip off the earth into space. Lester awoke in the morning to find the sunshine streaming into the room, and White sitting up and regarding with some perplexity a badly blistered finger. "'Where are the others?' inquired Lester. "'Gone, I suppose,' said White. "'We must have been asleep.' 
Lester arose and, stretching his stiffened limbs, dusted his clothes with his hands and went out into the corridor. White followed. At the noise of their approach, a figure, which had been lying asleep at the other end, sat up and revealed the face of Barnes. "'Why, I've been asleep,' he said in surprise. "'I don't remember coming here. How did I get here?' "'Nice place to come for a nap,' said Lester, severely, as he pointed to the gap in the balusters. "'Look there. Another yard and where you would have been.' He walked carelessly to the edge and looked over. In response to his startled cry and the others drew near, and all three stood gazing at the dead man below. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.